Hi, good morning. Uh, welcome to the uh, tutorial, Deep Reinforcement Learning with uh, Applications in Transportation. Um, my name is uh, Tony Chin. Um, I'm a research scientist with uh, DD Research America, which is based in Mountain View um, in South Bay. Um, and this tutorial is jointly developed by me and my colleague, uh, Jian Tang and uh, Ji Ping Ye. Um, but unfortunately, they, they have a con uh, conflicting schedule, so I'll be giving the entire tutorial. Um, uh, so here's our outline for today. Um, we'll have a brief introduction on uh, you know the machine learning paradigms and what is reinforcement learning, um, and then uh, we'll go into uh, some basics. Uh, we start from the value-based reinforcement learning, um, and then we'll go on to uh, policy-based reinforcement learning and uh, some uh, aspects on multi-agent reinforcement learning. And finally, we'll uh, conclude by some discussions on practical issues. Um, and throughout the tutorial, uh, we will emphasize a lot on applications. So I'll show um, uh, many uh, recent application works in, uh, related to uh, transportation and, and ride sharing, since you know. Um, how many of you uh, are familiar with uh, DD, uh, what we do? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's a it's a basically a, a very large scale uh, mobile uh, ride sharing platform in it. Uh, with a primary uh, market uh, in China, but uh, we are now also expanding to uh, Latin America and uh, some other markets uh, in the world. Uh, yeah, so this is just a. Uh, a uh, brief history of uh, urban transportation. Uh, we've come a long, a long way uh, in terms of uh, transportation. Uh, first starting from a wheeled vehicle uh, a few thousand years ago, uh, 3500 BC. And then uh, we start to see the first road network, the first public transportation, uh, first bicycle, and then um, um, uh, automobile and cars are used to be uh, very expensive uh, uh, property, but uh, later on uh, we start to have affordable automobile for uh, for the mass population. Uh, and then um, we'll, uh, we have the uh, electric traffic lights to uh, you know manage the traffic on the road. And more recently, we start to have uh, the uh, national uh, highway system, um, and now we are starting transforming into the area of so-called smart transportation. Um, so in smart transportation, there are uh, basically uh, three parties, uh, the travelers, uh, the vehicles, um, and infrastructure, and they interact, they interact with each other. Um, so the transformation uh, to smart transportation system uh, goes from uh, driving alone to uh, sharing a ride with someone else, uh, from you know human driving to autonomous driving, um, and uh, from independent uh, systems to uh, a system that has a cooperation between vehicle and the uh, the infrastructure. Um, so for yeah. Uh, for the for the third point, I think for the first two points, it's uh, pretty easy to understand. Uh, for the third point, um, uh, usually it, it shows in the way of um, uh, you know the smart uh, traffic lights um, and um, uh, and those um, uh, traffic board that that shows real time uh, information. So those are the basic ones for uh, the smart tra infrastructure. Um, and later on, uh, uh, some cities in the in the world are starting to experiment, you know, with um, uh, 
transferring information between uh, your vehicles to, uh, to the infrastructure on the road. And, and the, uh, the re revolution for smart transportation uh, definitely uh, cannot go without uh, machine learning, the development of machine learning, which has by itself gone uh, a long way. Um, and then we'll, uh, we'll briefly talk about you know, uh, the uh, supervised, unsupervised, but uh, we really will focus on uh, reinforcement learning. Yeah. And the reinforcement learning has been benefited uh, tremendously by uh, the recent uh, explosive development in deep learning, um, which allows it to um, to be a more a applicable to a, uh, a lot of applications. Um, so machine learning uh, can basically be divided into three um, paradigms. So the first one is um, uh, predictive machine learning, which is to estimate and you know forecast certain quantities based on your uh, predictive signals, which, which also we call features. Um, and typically, those tasks are classification and uh, regression. Uh, you have your features, and and you have your supervised signals uh, to uh, to do your learning tasks. Um, and the second task is a descriptive uh, task, uh, which is try to characterize the key properties of a data set uh, or, or a group of objects. Um, so here, uh, typically, you don't, have a, uh, you don't have a label per se. So you're trying to uh, discover uh, the, uh, the patterns uh, in the data set. Um, and uh, some of the example tasks include uh, clustering or uh, dimensionality reduction. And uh, the third paradigm is prescriptive. So uh, in, in this domain, in this class of problems, uh, we are trying to uh, make decisions uh, which tells us what to do in different scenarios. So we're, we're trying to uh, utilize um, predictive and descriptive methods and, um, uh, and make better decisions. Uh, for the long run, and you know, this kind of problem is uh, typically also known as optimization. Right. Yeah. So, uh, so in supervised learning, um, your data is in the form of uh, instances of uh, description, a uh, descriptive data, uh, which are basically feature vectors. Uh, the X case, and then uh, for each instance, you have a label associated with it, the Y K. Um, and we want to we want to learn the uh, learn the model, which is uh, a mapping f of x uh, from the data, uh, the features and labels, uh, to to capture the pattern between the features and labels. Um, so, for example, for classification, then the output is uh, uh, is binary or discrete, um, and uh, for regression, then the output is uh, continuous and uh, real numbers. Yeah. Uh, in unsupervised learning, then um, as I just mentioned, uh, we only have descriptive data. Uh, and we usually don't have labels. So some of the uh, learning tasks in this domain uh, include uh, trying to find a low rank and latent representation. Uh, so for example, in the uh, manifold learning, we are trying to, uh, uh, we're trying to uh, discover the, uh, the latent representation of the data, which might be in high dimensional space. Uh, and in, for this Swiss row, um, the uh, underlying uh, representation can really be shown as a, uh, on a, on a one-dimensional space. And, we, and sometimes we also want to find the grouping structure, uh, which is basically clustering, uh, trying, to, trying to find uh, the uh, grouping structure for similar, homo uh, more homogeneous objects. 
Mm, and in deep and in deep learning, uh, we have the uh, autoencoder decoder, uh, which is in a way also trying to uh, uh, find a uh, latent representation of, for example, an image, um, or and and the result, well, which is in the in the center, uh, is the so-called embeddings. Um, now, uh, in reinforcement learning, uh, the problem setup is quite different. Um, so here, uh, we have an agent which interacts with the environment. Uh, the agent executes an action uh, based on its state uh, in each step um, and receives a reward from the environment. So it's an it's a interactive process. Um, and you continuously getting uh, feedback from, from the environment that you operate in. So we want to, here we want to find an optimal policy, uh, which we denote by pi star, uh, to, to achieve um, maximum cumulative rewards in the long run. So we are not trying to uh, optimize our gain in the immediate next step, but we are trying to uh, uh, act in a way that it's going to maximize our uh, long-term uh, long reward. Yeah. So, uh, so the way that it's different from the other two uh, paradigms is that uh, this in reinforcement learning, although we are trying to optimize the long run, uh, long run reward, but we don't have supervision on the long term reward. Uh, we only have uh, immediate feedback. So, so we have to um, uh, utilize the uh, immediate feedback signal to. Uh, uh, to guide our uh, learning process. Um, and the feedback is often delayed, right? So if you, uh, if you take an action at time t, then um, your reward can sometimes come back at uh, a few time steps later. Mm, it's, a it's a sequential decision process, um, and <coughs> the uh, agent's action affects subsequent data received. So, so it's a more, uh, more like an um, active learning process. So you, you can decide um, what kind of data that you are receiving later by, by taking uh, appropriate actions. Um, and in recent years, we have seen the rise uh, of reinforcement learning. We have uh, heard a lot of success stories. Uh, in applications like uh, chess, board games, uh, for example, in uh, uh, AlphaGo has achieved uh, quite a huge success uh, in playing the game of Go uh, against world champions, uh, human world champions, um, and and we have we have seen that deep reinforcement learning algorithms have been playing very well. Uh, in um, in some of the arcade games, the Atari games, um, as well as uh, in in robotics tasks, um, and there are actually uh, a lot more uh, applications for uh, for reinforcement learning in in other domains. Uh, for example, in transportation, which we'll focus uh, in this tutorial, um, and um, and actually, applications in recommendation system um, has an even longer history because uh, uh, people start, um, started to use uh, a simpler version of reinforcement learning, which is called um, multi-armed bandits or contextual bandits in the recommendation system for quite a, quite a, uh, quite a while already. Um, and there are applications, uh, for example, in uh, industrial control, um, as well as in uh, education. Um, so I also um, give an introduction about um, the uh, how it works on the ride sharing platform. So this is a, a pair of screenshots uh, for a typical scenario when you are trying to get a ride on on the ride sharing platform. Um, here we um, mostly we focus on single passenger trips. Um, you know, there are another another set of uh, trips 
which uh, in which multiple passengers share a vehicle, so that's carpooling. Um, but for most of the works we are talking about here, uh, uh, we'll focus on single passenger trips. We will have some.
Um, and, and we're also looking at uh, the, some of the applications in autonomous vehicle control. Uh, so this is, a, uh, this is a very new area. And, um, and in, the, in the autonomous vehicle control framework, uh, you have, typically you have several modules, uh, perception, uh, which is basically to deal with visual and sensory uh, signals, uh, and the planning module, which is trying to uh, uh, plan uh, the vehicle behavior, uh, plan the motion, and we have we have control module, uh, with for example for uh, tracking the pass or uh, or tracking the lane. Right? Um, there are a few challenges in uh, uh, autonomous vehicle control uh, due to the complexity of the environment. Uh, we have you know all kinds of colors, uh, uh, sh object shapes. Uh, Different types of objects. Uh, you have you have complex uh, background, and uh, you have different viewpoints, um, and um, and you want a smooth control. Uh, for example, when you turn a vehicle, you want a, a, a smooth turning, um, and um, and since the environment changes very quickly, the the control uh, algorithm has to adapt to the environment very very quickly as well, um, and ultimately. Uh, safety uh, is a very uh, particular uh, emphasis of this type of problem, uh, unlike other uh, reinforcement learning applications. Uh, yeah, so, so here, uh, exploration would be a, would be a very uh, sensitive, yeah. Yeah, so, so we have, we have uh, introduced the several uh, groups of applications that we'll see. So uh, we'll go into uh, some basics on uh, different types of reinforcement learning algorithms uh, to prepare us uh, for the different uh, applications in the literature, as well as some of the works that have been, uh, have been done in my group. Yeah, so the reinforcement learning, uh, as I said, it deals with uh, sequential decision making. Uh, the, so here in the entire process, um, we have multiple stages. And a decision is to be made at each time step. Right? Um, and each step affects the subsequent step. Um, so, uh, so you have to, basically you have to look into or uh, infer the future, uh, in order to uh, um, optimize in the, for the long run. Um, and here, the only information you have uh, available is for the current step, uh, and and of course the future is uncertain. Um, otherwise, um, uh, it will be much less challenging. Um, and, and of course, we are interested in the long-term objective. Um, there are basically two uh, major challenges. One is um, uh, how we could uh, evaluate the quality of the decisions, uh, taking in, uh, the future into account. Um, and the second challenge is uh, how, how, do you, how do you characterize the future? So. So, so uh, uh, the Markov decision process is uh, is a fundamental uh, process that underlines uh, uh, basically most of the reinforcement learning algorithms. Uh, so here's a here's a setup for uh, the MDP. Uh, we have a few uh, elements of the uh, of the process uh, uh, here, um, as I mentioned. The, the setup is such that the agent interacts with the environment uh, through, uh, through a feedback loop. So the, the agent has a state, uh, which usually is denoted by ST. Um, and, um, and for example, so, so for example, the state could be the agent's location uh, uh, or some other uh, system properties. Um, and um, in, the, in the fully observable environment, then your observation is 
uh, equal to your state. Uh, but in a, in a partially observable environment, the, then you also have an ob observation uh, vector, uh, which represents what the agent sees. And, and in, uh, it could be just a subset of the, the state of the entire uh, system. Um, and the agent can execute the action so, uh, from, from the action space. And the action can be uh, both uh, either discrete or continuous. Uh, so, for, for example, here uh, in this very simple uh, robot uh, toy example, uh, the action of the agent can be to go forward or go backward or turning left or right. So this is a, this is a discrete action space. Um, and the agent receives a, a reward from the system uh, in each time step, um, and the reward uh, is governed by the reward function, uh, which depends on, which is a, a function of the uh, state of the agent as well as the action that the agent executes on the current state. Um, and uh, in this toy example, for example, uh, uh, we will we'll get a positive reward by reaching the uh, exit or by uh, reaching some goals. And um, and and we get a we get a negative uh, or we get a penalty uh, for uh, each movement, so that we we want to uh, find an optimal policy that allows you to uh, reach the exit uh, with as as few uh, number of steps as possible. Um, and the, the MDP has the Markovian property, which means that uh, the, next, the next state, uh, the state in the next time step uh, is governed by a distribution uh, that's only dependent on your current state and action. Yeah. So, and, and it's independent from uh, anything else uh, prior to that. Um, so there are, so, uh, so in, in this slide, um, I laid out like, those are basic elements that are uh, basically uh, would, be, would be given uh, by the problem uh, uh, or except in the, uh, in the model free case, then, um, uh, then you, don't, you don't have the uh, transition probability. Uh, and, and here there, uh, there are some quantities that we uh, usually want to learn through uh, reinforcement learning. Uh, we, want to, we want to learn the policy. Uh, the policy governs uh, the agent's uh, decision making. So the policy is, um, is a function of the state. So given the agent's current state, then the policy tells you uh, what action to take under this state. Uh, and the policy uh, can also be a deterministic or stochastic. A determinist policy gives you uh, uh, a specific action, and a stochastic policy gives you a distribution uh, on the action space. So, uh, so you usually you have to you have to sample from uh, the output of the policy in order to uh, to get your next action. Um, and the ne next key quantity that uh, we want to learn in the reinforcement learning method is, um, uh, is value function. The value function is an uh, estimate of the future long-term reward. Uh, and we have two types of uh, value function, typically. Uh, uh, one is uh, uh, the so-called uh, v-value function. Uh, we denote it by v. That's a state uh, value function. Uh, it's the uh, discounted uh, ex expectation of the discounted cumulative reward, uh, given that you are currently at state S, right? and the, and the Q function, uh, which is a, a state action value function, uh, is um, is uh, is slightly uh, more complicated. So it's conditioned on uh, your current state and the current action that you take. 
um, and it's also an expectation of the uh, discount accumulated rewards. Um, the gamma gamma here is the uh, is the discount factor. So to understand the discount factor, we just think about you know the uh, 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 inflation rate when you when you save your money, right? So so a hundred dollars. Uh, uh, that you receive 10 years later uh, is typically uh, in the in the smaller amount if you if you think about it in the in the current time point. Yeah, um, and the environment model um, it's the it's the dynamics that that governs the change in the state with actions. Yeah, so th so this is. Uh, this is really the transition probabilities uh, and the reward. Those are those two elements uh, gives you the environment model. Now the objective function uh, in the Markov decision process is to uh, uh, maximize the expected uh, discounted cumulative reward. Yeah. Um, and uh, the policy pi determines the action. Uh, and yeah, and I mentioned the, the discount factor. So, so now we have, uh, we are equipped with all the, all the basic knowledge about the elements of, of, a, of a Markov decision process. Uh, there are uh, different types of reinforcement learning methods. So here I characterize uh, them into uh, into two big groups. So in terms of uh, whether you have a model in your method, uh, we have model-based and model-free method. Uh, a model-based method maintains a uh, approximation of the environment model. Yeah. So, so we see that. Uh, <coughs> In order to in order to maintain the model, uh, you need to have a, a transition probability that tells you uh, uh, which state you will be in um, after you uh, execute a particular action on the current state, uh, and and then uh, you you compute your policy or or the uh, value function uh, based on the approximation of the model, right? Um, and if uh, if we don't uh, explicitly uh, approximate the environment model in the method, then we are uh, we are in a model-free method uh, that just uses a data-driven method to uh, to directly compute the policy or value function. So, for example, uh, we'll see uh, the DeepQ network uh, for uh, for playing the Atari games. So that's a that's a model-free method, um, and uh, depending on what you learn or or what you compute uh, through the re reinforcement learning method, then uh, you also have different types of methods. That's value-based uh, or policy-based or both. So a value-based reinforcement learning method, uh, the main task is to uh, learn the value function. So with, uh, whether it's a, it's a V value function, the state value function, or the state action value function. Um, so policy here is uh, implicit, and uh, it's derived from found value. So for example, if you, uh, if you follow a greedy policy, then after you get the value function, you just pick the, pick the action uh, that maximizes your, uh, your value function. Uh, in the in the policy based method, then uh, you you're trying to learn the policy function directly uh, by uh, interpreting the problem as a, as an optimization problem in terms of the policy. So so you go along the gradient of the policy. So that's that's why it's all, it's also called uh, policy gradient methods. Um, so typically, no value function is explicitly involved here. 
But if you have both, then uh, we'll see there's uh, another type, uh, family of methods called actor critic. Uh, actor means the policy, and critic is your value function. Um, if you uh, if you have the, the full knowledge of your environment dynamics, then you can you can solve the MDP by uh, just by dynamic programming. Yeah. So so we all know that DP uh, it's it's based on you know the principle of optimality uh, by uh, solving a uh, a bigger subproblem through the solutions of a, of a small subproblem of shorter time lengths. Uh, yeah, so think, uh, because DP uh, requires the full knowledge of the, uh, of the Markov decision process, so it's, uh, uh, it's really a model-based method. Now, um, how, do we, how do we compute the value function uh, in this case? Since we, <coughs> since we know the model, then you know, uh, we, we know the transition probability, right? And, um, and, and we know the reward function. So we have, so we are, have no problem computing, uh, computing the expectation, given those uh, uh, those two quantities, uh, and we and we just uh, apply the definition of the uh, expectation of the cumulative reward, uh, and write the value function uh, in a recursive way. Uh, then we are iteratively updates the values for all the states. Uh, now, um, after we get the value function, how do we uh, how do we uh, improve the policy? So, so then what we have uh, the uh, policy iteration, which uses the uh, the poli iterative policy evaluation uh, as the subroutine. So, so then uh, given a policy pi, then you apply the uh, the policy evaluation steps. To uh, to compute your v v pi, so v pi is the value function associated to your policy pi, um, and then you improve upon it by uh, by deriving a greedy policy with respect to your uh, current value function. So you do this iteratively until the policy converges, and it, typically it uh, converges quite quickly, uh, and. And there, there are nice theories uh, around the DP methods. Uh, so, so assume we are uh, we are using a, a greedy policy, then the policy improvement theorem uh, tells us that uh, we are uh, we are guaranteed to have an improvement, uh, you know, in terms of the in terms of value, uh, unless we are already optimal. So, so the so the inequality here uh, is strict. Uh, if if we are haven't reached our uh, optimal policy yet, yeah, and we'll uh, sometimes we'll also hear the term generalized policy iteration. So that just that just means a framework uh, that has one major step that uh, computes a value function, and another step that uh, derives the uh, policy based on the value that you compute. Um, so for order dispatching, actually, uh, we uh, we adopt we have some of our methods that's based on the <coughs> generalized policy iteration. Um, so so in policy iteration, we seen that we have to uh, call a subroutine which is iterative by itself. Uh, uh, but can we uh, can we early stop the policy uh, evaluation process? Right. Uh, so, so in the, in the extreme, we can we can uh, just uh, do one step of the policy evaluation process, and then uh, immediately go on to the policy improvement. So, if you do that, and then that gives you the uh, value iteration. Yeah. So that uh, that direct directly uh, you directly compute the maximal. Uh, the maximal uh, long-term uh, expected reward uh, based on your 
value function from the last iteration. Yeah. So here, what you are really doing is you are that you are uh, iteratively uh, applying the Bellman optimality condition. Yeah. And and we can um, we can write uh, this for, uh, this update step uh, very concisely in terms of the Bellman operator, uh, which is which is a linear operator. So so in terms of um, uh, operator vector multiplication, um, and we can show that uh, the Bellman operator is a uh, is a gamma contraction. So so you are guaranteed with convergence. Uh, so for policy iteration, uh, for policy evaluation, uh, then uh, your iterates will converge to the value function associated with your current policy, uh, pi, and um, and for policy iteration, then you'll converge to the uh, optimal value as well as the uh, optimal policy, um, and um, and it turns out that the uh, the operator t star. Uh, which is the operator correspond to uh, correspond to the value iteration uh, uh, iteration expression. So that the t star is also a gamma contraction. So uh, so so we have convergence for uh, value iteration as well. So so far on the theoretical side, it's all good. So you have uh, all these methods are uh, have convergence property. Mm. Now, uh, what if uh, you don't have an environment model, well, which is uh, which is very typical in, uh, uh, in in practical applications? Environment model is too complex to uh, uh, to approximate. <coughs> so, so in this case, um, uh, we have to resort to uh, data-driven methods. So there, are, there again, there are two uh, major types of Methods. One is based on Monte Carlo simulation, uh, and the other, uh, the other family of methods is the so-called uh, temporal difference learning. So MC evaluation, uh, as the name suggests, uh, it, it basically it, uh, uses the empirical uh, mean uh, of the simulated trajectory uh, to uh, to approximate the expected cumulative reward. Mm. So it has to learn from complete episodes, uh, so that uh, uh, that's also one of its limitation, right? That you you have to you have to simulate complete episodes, uh, but the good side is that uh, it has good convergence properties even with uh, uh, function approximation, when when you are uh, when you are using, uh, for example. Uh, using a linear function to approximate your value function. <coughs> um, uh, f for temporal difference learning, the TD learning, uh, the good side compared to uh, MC evaluation is that you can learn from incomplete episodes. So if you, uh, if your uh, experience is just in terms of uh, individual transitions, you can still you can still uh, run the uh, TD learning and uh, Estimate the value functions. So, so the updates is based on bootstrapping. Uh, you construct the target, uh, which is also based on the estimate itself. Yeah, it's it's usually more uh, efficient uh, than uh, MC method, but but the downside is that um, convergence is not always guaranteed with the function approximation. Yeah. So let's take a look at. Uh, the MC valuation. So uh, we we have a we have a sample based cumulative reward. It is called the cumulative reward, which we write as G capital G T. So so you just add up um, the the reward that you see from your Monte Carlo rollouts uh, from from the different time steps, um, and you have different ways uh, to. Uh, uh, to do the MC evaluation, right? So, so you have we have the first visit or or every visit. So the first visit is that um, you start to uh, compute the cumulative reward for a particular state 
uh, uh, every time you see that state, the first occurrence uh, in the in the uh, Monte Carlo rollout. And the every visit is that you compute the cumulative reward for every time the state uh, appears in the in the episode. Yeah. So so convergence is guaranteed by a uh, law of large numbers because you uh, you do a lot of rounds of simulation. You uh, compute uh, you compute different instances of the sample based uh, cumulative rewards for different different state. Uh, and then you take the average. So if you if you sample, if you uh, do your Monte Carlo rollouts large enough, then you are guaranteed with convergence. Um, and you can also learn uh, the Q function in a similar way. So so instead instead of the first time you see uh, state S, then uh, it changes to the first time you see state S and executes action A. Right. Uh, yeah, and um, and and s sometimes people use a more uh, convenient form of, in uh, of incremental update, uh, which can be helpful in the non-stationary environment as well. <laughs> now, I I said that uh, the other uh, type of method. Uh, in contrast to MC evaluation is uh, temporal difference learning. Uh, so, so most of the uh, TD learning method we, s we see, uh, we come across is the so-called TD0, uh, which is just based on uh, one transition. Right? So uh, a transition uh, consists of the element of current state, the the action that you execute on the current state, the reward that you received at the current time step, and uh, your next state, and your uh, and and sometimes uh, the the next action that you that you uh, execute. Yeah. So uh, so we recall that. Uh, here, uh, for Monte Carlo methods, we have an incremental update form. S um, so in, in the temporal difference learning, actually, uh, we just, uh, we just uh, replace the actual uh, return with the bootstrap target uh, in the incremental form. Um, so the bootstrap target here is, is this part, the, the immediate reward plus the discounted uh, future value. So yeah, so that that basically gives you a, a, a approximate of the uh, of the GT, which is the um, uh, the sample based cumulative reward. Um, and the uh, the update term uh, is called the temporal difference error uh, because it's a it's a difference uh, between between the approximation of the um, uh, the approximation of the value starting from uh, the state st using the uh, the sample of the reward gained from uh, the current transition uh, as compared to uh, using the uh, uh, the value function itself right so, so this approximation really, uh, if you think about uh, Monte Carlo rollout, it just roll out one step, and then for starting from the next step, then you use bootstrapping, you use the uh, value function estimate again. Yeah. So the so the TD target is biased because um, because you are just using uh, using a, a sample uh, reward. For uh, for the tar current time step, yeah. But but the advantage is that it has a much lower uh, variance than than GT because uh, because it's only based on one step of transition instead of uh, you roll out the entire uh, episode and compute the sample 
cumulative reward out of it. Um, we have we have an end step version of the bootstrapping, so uh, it's uh, easy to understand. You just uh, you just roll out more steps and uh, uh, accumulate more samples of the reward. You add add them up, and then um, starting from the end step, you you use bootstrapping. You use the uh, estimate of the value function itself to compute the end step, and which can later uh, substitute into um, uh, into into this part. Um, yeah, so so if you use end step bootstrapping, um, you you have two different kinds of views. Uh, the forward view, uh, uh, basically, it, it has an easier uh, update form. But, uh, but as we can see, you have, in order to do the forward view update, you have to, uh, you have, to have uh, complete uh, episodes. You have to roll out uh, your trajectory uh, up to the end of the episode in order to be able to uh, uh, compute the GT. Uh, so, so then uh, you ha we have another type of uh, view that, that's the backward view. So that allows you to uh, do the update just based, on, uh, just based on the sample of one transition. <coughs> um, so far, we have, we have been uh, focusing on uh, you know, computing the value for the state. Uh, but how about uh, performing control, right? Eventually, uh, the purpose of using reinforcement learning algorithm is to uh, derive a policy. You want to make decisions. Uh, but uh, if we just have the value function y, uh, v pi, uh, how do we make uh, control decisions? Uh, it seems that we still have to know uh, the uh, transition probabilities in order to find uh, a greedy policy, right? Uh, but, but hey, we are in model-free domain, so we don't have uh, transition probabilities. Uh, so what do we do? Yeah. So in this case, we can we can learn the state action value function uh, directly. Uh, now, um, uh, in learning the state state action value function, uh, we uh, we had to talk about uh, two different kinds of policy. So one is called the behavioral policy, uh, which generates the training samples, um, and the target policy is the one that you really uh, want to learn about and optimize. Yeah. Um, so, so uh, depending on uh, whether your behavioral policy uh, and the target policy is the same or not, then uh, we have the so-called on policy method and off policy method. We'll see that um, uh, the method SASA it's a, um, it's an on policy method. So it's basically um, uh, it it uses it uses uh, uh, temporal difference learning. Uh, in, instead of uh, Monte Carlo method, to to learn the Q value function, the state action value function. Uh, for off policy, a very common method that we'll see is Q learning. Yeah. So so SASAR is uh, it, it's a it's a very easy <coughs> to understand. Uh, so it looks very similar to a TD zero, except that uh, for each for each transition, you have you have to know uh, the next action as well. So you, you require slightly more information in order to do the updates. Uh, but otherwise, it's uh, uh, it has a very similar form to TD zero. Uh, you you, uh, you just you just plug in the temporal difference um, updates. Yeah. Um, and since since uh, it has an uh, it has a similar form to TD0, then it also, also has a lambda form, uh, which correspond uh, to end-step bootstrapping. Uh, 
but uh, using the Q value function. Yeah. Uh, so SASA is a, is the on policy method, um, and for our policy method, we have well, we want to focus on Q learning. Uh, it's a it's also a t uh, based on temporal difference update, uh, but it's a, it's a off policy control method. Um, so we see that the key difference here uh, is that uh, for Sasa, the updates just follows the uh, the transition experience. Just it just follows the uh, the episode itself. But for Q learning, uh, you have a maximization step over there. So Q learning it directly approximates the optimal Q value function instead of uh, for Sasa, it tries to learn the Q value function uh, corresponding to the current policy. Right. So that so that's why there's a there's a, a maximization term over there. Um, and the next uh, the the next action uh, in the in your data is uh, uh, is chosen by the behavioral policy. But you are you are trying to uh, your target policy is the optimal policy. So those two policies can be different, and that's why it's a, it's an off policy control method. Um, uh, both but both uh, SASAR and Q learning has a um, com uh, nice convergence property. Yeah, um, and and here it's just a, a very simple example showing the different. Uh, different property of uh, uh, of a Sasa and Q learning in the in a very simple example. Uh, so after uh, after training, uh, so eventually the two methods converge to the same um, to the same cumulative reward. Uh, but during the during the training, the Q learning, I think it. Um, uh, it goes. It goes a safer uh, path. While oh, uh, Q learning actually goes through this path, while the uh, Sasa goes goes a path uh, on the top. <coughs> so we have we have talked about uh, you know different types of methods, and I really like this page uh, from the. Uh, from the Sutton and Battle uh, reinforcement learning uh, textbook, so I took a uh, took a snapshot of it. Uh, it summarizes those uh, different types of methods in a very nice way. Uh, so at, at the different corners, it represents um, the different uh, different extremes in terms of uh, algorithm approach. Uh, so on the top left hand side corner, you have you have the uh, sample-based method uh, that also uses bootstrapping. So, so those are uh, the those are Q learning, SASA, and uh, TD learning. Remember that we are uh, because we use bootstrapping, we we don't require full episodes. We can we can learn based on uh, incomplete episodes. But if we are if we have complete episodes. Data, then uh, we we can use uh, Monte Carlo evaluation. We can use Monte Carlo MC control, uh, and in terms of up, uh, the width, width of update, um, so so going from sample based to uh, to a more to a model based basically, then uh, then you have you have value iteration, uh, policy iteration, or general. Generalized the PI uh, because in those cases you you, you know the uh, uh, or at least you maintain approximation of the transition probability, yeah, and then going going the extreme in both directions and you you are doing exhaustive search, yeah, you uh, you are exploiting the model dynamics as well as well as the full uh, episodes, yeah. So we talked about a lot of uh, uh, like algorithm basics for reinforcement learning, and now let's uh, uh, look at some 
practical examples, applications in uh, ride sharing and in uh, transportation. Uh, the first one that I want to show is uh, uh, with regard to uh, order dispatching. Sometimes we, uh, uh, we call it order matching uh, because it's really just uh, trying to match uh, passengers and drivers uh, at each time step. Mm. So the way that uh, that this matching process works uh, in the in the typical ride sharing platform is that uh, you have uh, you have discrete time intervals, uh, typically in in uh, in terms of a few seconds, and within each time interval, you buffer uh, the available drivers uh, on the platform as well as uh, the incoming passenger requests. So. So now, uh, within each time interval, then uh, the decision that you have to make is to is to do a, basically do a bipartite matching. Yeah. Um, there are several considerations. Uh, uh, so we know we have talked about the fact that uh, each dis dispatching decision will affect the future, uh, basically the supply distribution, the driver distribution. Um, we want to maximize the driver's uh, collective income. Uh, uh, at the same time, we also want to uh, ensure good customer experience, uh, which is in terms of waiting time for pickup. Yeah. So we'll, we'll utilize different, uh, different methods uh, from the single agent point of view or from the multi-agent uh, point of view. So this is a this is a generalized policy iteration uh, framework that I that I mentioned. Uh, so so here at the high level, uh, the way we, that we want to do it is um, that uh, we we update in the uh, uh, in the slower pace basically. Uh, for example, we update the policy uh, every. What every day or every week uh, in this generalized policy iteration. So, so in the evaluation step, uh, we learn uh, the value function from uh, the trip data that we have collected uh, throughout the several days uh, within the update interval. And then based on that learned uh, value function, then uh, we derive the uh, the uh, basically so-called collective uh, greedy policy with respect to the value function, which allows us to do the matching. So in order to learn the value function, we have to uh, define, uh, define the MDP process. Uh, so in this case, we, uh, we define the MDP from the driver's point of view. So it's a driver-centric uh, method. Uh, in this framework, each agent is a driver, um, and the state of the agent is uh, is a discretized spatial temporal uh, space. So you can you can discretize the uh, the the map into hexagon grids. Uh, you can also discretize your time in terms of time buckets. Um, the action of the agent is uh, to pick up a particular order. Or, or do nothing, which is uh, just stay and, and, and idle, right? And the reward is very, is very clear. So it's just the driver's income from a particular trip. Uh, and the episode is uh, starting from the beginning of the day to the end of the day. Yeah. And the value function is the expected, uh, expected cumulative income of a, of a driver uh, throughout the day. Yeah, so this is, a, this is a just an illustration of, uh, of the policy evaluation. So here, for policy evaluation, we use a, we, we use a, a tabular form of a TD0 method. Uh, let me just, yeah. Uh, so this is, this is a one transition. Uh, the trip starts from here, and the trip ends here. Oh, actually, um, I think this is uh, this is the idle movement. 
so the driver originally is here and uh, moves to this spot, uh, and it, the driver picks up a trip and goes to the destination. Right. So, so uh, when the when the vehicle is vacant, then your immediate reward is zero, uh, but you still you can still uh, update your value function um, by the transition, and if. Uh, if the driver is serving the order, then uh, then the agent receives the receives the reward R, which is a trip fee. Yeah. So you uh, through you know through historical data, we have collected a lot of uh, so every trip basically corresponds to a transition, and then the th uh, within the historical data, you have a lot of transitions. Uh, and we we recall that uh, to do TD zero, we don't have to. We don't have to have a complete episode. So even if your uh, historical data is not in the complete uh, complete episodes, then that's still okay. Uh, you can you can still uh, learn learn a value function with respect to the current dispatching policy uh, from from the historical data that you collect. Um, and on the right side, it's just. Uh, uh, it's just a plot of the value function at different times of the day. Uh, now we have learned the value function. Um, how do we how do we derive the uh, uh, the policy out of it? Uh, so I mentioned that it's it's basically a bipartite matching. So the key here is to define the edge weights, right? Uh, and with the learned value function, we we find that uh, there's a there's a nice way to define the edge weights, which is use so we uh, so-called ad advantage uh, with respect to the value. So the advantage is in the in the same form as a temporal difference error, actually. Um, and um, and they basically, you can think about it as uh, scoring uh, each pair of driver and order. So uh, to provide a score for, uh, for each potential match. Um, and then you solve the bipartite matching uh, to which, um, which maximizes the, the total uh, advantage within, within the group of drivers and passengers. Uh, so then uh, the iteration will go on. Um, after you, ha you, you derive the new policy, then uh, you uh, match the orders uh, using the new policy to collect more data, and then you can, uh, you can learn the value function using TD0 again, um, and then so on. Is the same policy for all the drivers? Uh, yeah, so uh, it's, a, it's a policy for doing the bipartite matching, so it has to be, you know. It has to be the same. Right, right. Yeah. In this case, uh, you can think of it as crowdsourcing the experience from all the agents. Yeah. It's a it's a really a simplified way of uh, approaching this multi agent problem. But later, I'll talk about uh, uh, our attempt uh, from the multi-agent perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I'll talk about another application uh, in driver uh, repositioning, or also known as uh, driver driver dispatching, uh, fleet management. So they, they basically means all the same thing. Uh, it focuses on the cruising action of the idle drivers. So instead of uh, instead of matching a driver to an uh, order here, uh, actually no orders is involved. Uh, you just you just decide uh, where to go uh, to uh, to anticipate future reward uh, to, uh, future uh, orders. Mm, yeah. So dispatching is an external factor. It's uh, with, we can think of it as part of the environment. Um, yeah. Um, so this is 
this is the one work uh, that does the repositioning using using uh, Monte Carlo learning. So, uh, so we have we have seen how MC learning works. Uh, here, the the data here in this application is uh, uh, in terms of the coordinates of the driver, uh, the the driver ID uh, and uh, the taxi status whether whether it's busy or or not. Right. Uh, yeah. By the way, this is a uh, this work is done by a group uh, uh, from Singapore. So, so I think this is uh, this is a part of the map of the Singapore. Yeah. So they so they annotate and they convert uh, they convert the data into into a driver activity graph uh, and pre-store the shortest pass information between points. Um, an episode here uh, is the entire uh, cruising process. So you start from the moment that you become the idol, and then you take a series of, of reposition actions, uh, and and then the, the episode ends when the driver finds a uh, finds a passenger, or when uh, uh, the driver decides to take a break. Yeah, and the trip cost is subtracted from the reward. Uh, the value function. So here they learn a Q value function in the tabular form, uh, and the value function can be uh, can be computed exactly by the MC learning method that we talked about in the previous slides. Yeah. Um, and and uh, beyond uh, learning the value function, um, uh, they also have a. Uh, scheme to uh, dynamically uh, define the zones. So I mentioned that uh, the map can be discretized by hexagon grids, uh, but you have so here uh, they have the freedom to uh, to decide which area occupies a larger grid and which area uh, is for a smaller grid. Uh, the trade-off is that uh, for larger zones, then uh, you have higher uncertainty in their value because uh, your uh, spatial temporal points within the larger zone uh, are more diverse, right? They are less likely to be uh, homogeneous. Uh, so, so the higher uncertainty in the value would affect the decision making. Uh, on the other hand, if you have smaller zones, uh, then you may not have enough data to learn the value well. So. So uh, you want to dynamically uh, determine the zone sizes uh, through data-driven methods. Yeah, and in, in simulation, uh, yeah, their, their evaluation is uh, in the simulation environment. So, uh, so, so they are from data, they define the, uh, the trip assignment probability, um, and they also consider the cruising cost. So, so I believe this environment is a single agent environment. They just consider uh, from the from the single driver point of view, uh, and um, and and the trajectory that that you can roll out from the simulator. Um, yeah, I want to mention another work uh, that's very recent. Uh, it also. Uh, consider the uh, repositioning problem uh, using the DP method. So, so the MDP defined here is uh, is very similar. Uh, you, you have the state uh, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of the driver's coordinates, time. Uh, I think they they have an additional indicator for uh, whether the driver has already been matched or not. Uh, so the situation here is on the ride sharing platform. Uh, there are eight actions, uh, so they operate within the grid uh, grid map world. So you have you have six neighboring grid, uh, and you have two additional actions correspond to a state, uh, stay or uh, uh, cruise around the grid or, or staying still. Okay. The episode is also a day from from the day beginning of the day to the end, uh, and. And um, learning the value function, for learning the value function, they um, uh, they use the, they use DP methods to compute the Q function. So by doing that, then you have to uh, 
uh, estimate all the uh, all kinds of probabilities because uh, you have you have to explicitly write out uh, write out the uh, expectation form for the q value function. So so they they estimate from data the uh, the order matching probability, pickup probability, uh, destination, and uh, order matching probability on trip. Uh, up, they they are done. They are learned from from the separate uh, process, and then after you have all those data, then uh, then you can uh, use DP to compute the Q value function, uh, which allows you to do the control. Yeah. Uh, so that uh, with that we uh, we have uh, looked at basically all the methods that's uh, based on tables. So they are tabular method. Uh, you represent the value function in the exact form, but uh, in the discretized form. Uh, so next we'll we'll look at uh, methods that uh, employs the value function approximation. So maybe. Let's see. Maybe we can take a f ten minute, five minute, ten minute uh, restroom break, and then uh, we'll come back and go on to the value function approximation. Yeah.
Uh, yeah. Is it working? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So next we'll uh, ne we'll talk about value function approximation because uh, uh, in the tabular form method, um, you know, we are representing the value function in the exact form, um, but um, you know, typically we are facing a high dimensional uh, situation, so so uh, we have to use a value function approximation to uh, to do the learning. Yeah. So since we are using a f we are using a functional form to represent the value function, uh, we can either use a linear function or nonlinear uh, function to approximate the value, uh, whether it's a state value or state action value. Yeah. Uh, but here we'll focus. Actually, we'll focus on uh, nonlinear approximation, uh, in particular the neural networks. Uh, yeah, I'll uh, go through very quickly here things I know. Uh, we all we all know about uh, neural networks, uh, how it works, and um, what's the what's the structure of the neural network. Uh, basically, uh, here you have it's all linear term, but the the nonlinear part of the neural network lies in the activation function. Uh, yeah, usually you have a 10H or uh, the ReLU uh, activation. So let's take another look at uh, Q learning. Uh, it's a it's a iterative process. Um, we. So if we start from here, then uh, the agent take an action, and then uh, you receive the uh, information about uh, one transition, the uh, SARS, right? Um, and then you use that information uh, to compute the target value uh, through a specific form, through the, uh, the temporal difference uh, form. And then with the target value, then, then you can update your parameters uh, for the value function. So if, if we use a, a neural network as a value function approximator, uh, then that gives us a, so the so-called uh, deep Q network. That's a DQN. <coughs> um, it, it allows us to uh, deal with a high dimensional um, uh, input and uh, state space. Yeah. S especially uh, in transportation applications, uh, very often we, we have to represent the state uh, by a number of features. So in that case, um, it's uh, impractical or infeasible to, to represent the value function in the tabular form. Um, now in DQN, uh, there are there are two uh, basically two features uh, that differentiates it from uh, the traditional Q learning method. Uh, one is uh, experience replay, and uh, the other one is a target network. Um, so, why do we need those uh, uh, two particular features in the uh, algorithm? Uh, it's it's because um, so when we are talk when we are talking about Q learning or TD learning, uh, we mentioned the one disadvantage of it compared to uh, MC uh, evaluation. That is uh, that when you are using value function approximation, then uh, you may not be guaranteed for convergence, and, um, and that is the case here, especially when you are using a nonlinear function approximator, and um, and and you are. Uh, you are doing the off-policy learning, which is a case of uh, Q learning, 
and, um, and you are using bootstrapping. So Q-learning uses uh, uh, the TD learning structure, so it's uh, based on bootstrapping. So when you have all three, uh, uh, all three things together, then uh, that's so-called the deadly triad. So that, that uh, usually uh, would uh, preclude uh, convergence guarantee for the, for the algorithm. So, so that means uh, DQN, it, uh, it does not have a theoretical convergence property, but, um, uh, but the, the novelty of the method is that um, it employs several uh, very effective uh, uh, heuristics to basically to make your uh, training more stable. And, um, and, and you have a, a better chance of uh, get, it, get it work in practical applications. Yeah. Um, so this is a this is the uh, recap of Q learning uh, with neural networks substituted into the uh, value function uh, in the in the very concise statement. So um, so there are, there are some potential problems uh, as I mentioned. Uh, when you are when you are using a, a nonlinear function approximator, uh, so one is one particular problem is the uh, correlation between the transition samples, uh, which which usually leads to unstable training. Uh, to to understand it in an intuitive way, when your uh, training transition samples are all correlated from one to uh, to the next uh, transition sample. Uh, if it happens that you have a very bad update in one in, in one particular step, um, and since your transition samples are all correlated, then your the error caused by your bad update in the uh, in the neural network approximating the value function will quickly propagate to uh, the other spaces, the other locations in the. Uh, in the input state space, yeah. So that's that's why it causes a, a instability in the training, um, and experience replay. Uh, in particular, it tries to break the correlations between the transition samples. Uh, how does how how does it do that? Um, it buffers all the uh, experience transition experiences in the in the replay buffer. And then at each step, when you're trying to update your, the parameters of your neural network for, uh, for the value function, then uh, you take a random sample from the replay buffer and, um, and, and you do the update based on that mini batch. So, uh, so in that way, then uh, your, the samples, the transition samples that you use to uh, update your value function from one step, one iteration to the next would be uh, uh, unlikely to correl correlate with each other. Yeah, so, so this is uh, just uh, to, uh, to, to put in uh, the replay buffer uh, feature that I talked about. Um, and, and you do mini batch update. So, uh, so you construct the target uh, based on uh, the mini batch of uh, transition samples, and you get the yi. And and at the update step, uh, you uh, basically do a stochastic gradient descent update uh, with respect to a least squares loss function. Yeah. So the next problem. Uh, lies in the maximization term here. So, so here uh, we see that the maximization term uh, is really computed by, uh, by the same uh, Q function for evaluating the value as well as for selecting the maximum, the, uh, the argmax action. Is there a way of determining um how big your replay buffer should be, and how often you should uh, <coughs> update your neural network uh, compared to uh, the number of times that you insert uh, a transition into the replay buffer. 
Uh, yeah, there are some studies like uh, trying to see the effect of different uh, sizes of replay buffer, but usually it's determined like by uh, by heuristics. Yeah. You just you can try a, a few uh, a few different sizes and um, yeah. Um, from our experience, it um, it doesn't. But of course, it depends on different applications. But it it doesn't seems to be very uh, uh, a very critical issue, yeah, as long as it's pretty large. Yeah. And regarding the updates, this is a one for one. Basically, when you insert a transition, you update your uh, neural network taking a mini batch. Right. So right. This is one for one. Would there be an advantage in uh, making it two for one, for instance, or? Um. Right, right. We we actually consider that uh, as well in our application. So, but uh, we we the consideration for us is really for uh, the time taken for training, right? If you do uh, one update for every, uh, for example, ten samples that you insert into the buffer, then you do less number of updates, and that that um, allows your Training to be faster in some in some cases, right? Instead of uh, doing one update for every insertion of the sample, uh, yeah. So it depends on the, the application. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. But for for training time uh, consideration, yes, it does make a, make a difference. Yeah, yeah. So so here the problem is really uh, you are. Uh, you are using the same function to to select the maximal action as well as to evaluating the action itself. Um, and um, and yeah, and the disadvantage it actually has the same intuitive uh, explanation is that uh, bad updates in queue can can also um, uh, quickly propagate. Um, so. Uh, so that's why we uh, we need a target network, uh, uh, which is really just a clone of the original uh, network, but updated at a at a slower fashion. So uh, so here, uh, in each iteration, you will update your target network. Uh, you update your original uh, network for the value function, but for the target network, you only update it for for example every. Uh, Every ten thousand iterations, or so. Yeah. So then, uh, you you can use uh, the target network to uh, to compute the target instead of using the original queue to compute the target. You use the target network to compute the the queue prime to compute the target, uh, and then you uh, update. Uh, the parameter zeta prime corresponding to Q prime for every uh, capital C steps. Yeah, this is, uh, this is just a copy of the uh, benchmark performance of DQN on, um, you know, on the range of Atari games. Uh, yeah, I think the uh, uh, the center line here is uh, human level performance. Uh, so for a lot of uh, a lot of game cases, uh, DQN outperforms uh, human level uh, performance. Um, so in DQN, we use the target network uh, to uh, to have something different for uh, constructing the target. But uh, we have another problem here. Uh, which is that um, even even though we are using a we are using a different network for computing the target uh, here we are uh, still using the same uh, target network for uh, for evaluating and selecting the action uh, so this uh, will likely to result in the overestimate of value um, we'll show uh, one slide for uh, sh demonstrating that that effect uh, on some uh, uh, specific uh, evaluation domains. Um, so 
in order to tackle, to mitigate that problem, uh, then uh, double DQN has been proposed. Uh, so the only difference between double DQN and the original uh, DQN is that then you use uh, you use different network to uh, evaluate uh, the maximal Q value and to uh, uh, to select the uh, corresponding action. So you use the original Q network to to select the action, and then you uh, you use the target network to compute the target value. So you use two uh, two different functions to do the different things. Um, and that makes it less likely to overestimate the value. Yeah, so this is uh, just to put in the, put in the, uh, uh, the modification for double DQN. Um, and, and this is the demonstration of uh, showing how uh, DQN can sometimes to uh, overestimate the value of uh, certain actions. So the, the orange part corresponds to the DQN, and uh, the purple part is for double DQN. So during training, we see that uh, uh, DQN, the, the training curve of DQN really lies uh, far above that of uh, the double DQN, but it's, uh, it's much less stable, actually. And the instability of the uh, of the training curve correspond to uh, a worse uh, performance score. So, so we see that the uh, overestimate of the value really has uh, some uh, detrimental effects on, on the learning itself. Yeah. So, um, so we also have um, methods uh, applying the DQN for solving the order dispatching problem. Um, so let's recall that uh, for order dispatching, uh, we have set up an MDP from a single driver's perspective, um, and, um, and the transitions correspond to uh, the individual trips themselves. Yeah, and, and in TD, tabular TD methods, uh, it's very, uh, intuitive and simple to uh, to perform the updates by just uh, using the trip data. But uh, that method is limited by uh, by its capacity of representing the state space uh, because you are, uh, you can only represent the state by uh, the coordinates of the driver and time. And that's already, uh, uh, if we represent the coordinates by uh, this hexagon grid ID, so that, that's already putting you into the two-dimensional space. And if you are putting uh, additional features, then you, uh, you will be uh, in a higher dimensional space, and, and it's harder to uh, represent the value function in that form. And, and, and uh, um, and the dimensionality of the value function would uh, quickly uh, becomes intractable if you discretize it. Um, so, but um, there are uh, many advantages uh, to use more features to, uh, to represent the state space of the driver, uh, to allow the value function to be uh, uh, more responsive to uh, real-time supply demand context changes. Right? For example, uh, we can we can represent, enrich the state feature by uh, the number of available drivers uh, around, the dri around this particular driver or uh, the uh, number of uh, open orders uh, within the neighborhood. So that, that gives you more information about uh, how the supply demand context uh, is like. Yeah. And also, uh, by using a neural network, it, uh, it f facilitates the learning from multiple cities and, and times and, and allows you to do a, a transfer learning. Um, yeah, but uh, training, uh, training a DQN network on the, uh, on the historical data, um, we, we have to uh, uh, perform some modifications uh, in order for it to uh, in order for the training to be uh, stable and successful. 
Yeah. So, uh, so the basic form of the training data is similar to uh, to the TD learning uh, situation. Uh, we also have the uh, location and time, uh, but we have a set of uh, contextual features F, uh, F0, or F1 uh, that represents the uh, supply demand context. Yeah, and, and everything else uh, pretty much stays the same. Um, but here, here uh, unlike uh, in the typical DQN case where uh, the, uh, the discrete action space is quite small, so, uh, so in the original DQN uh, network, the, uh, the actions are represented in such a way that uh, you, have, you have multiple uh, heads from the network, and then the input of the network is just the state features. Um, and so, so with the multiple heads, you can select uh, the action that maximizes the, va the Q value pretty easily. Uh, but in, in this case, uh, you can imagine that uh, the number of actions uh, available is, is huge um, because, because your action is just for taking a particular order. And the destination of the order uh, even if you discretize the, the entire map, it can be a, a, a pretty large number. And so, uh, so we directly put the action as part of the input to, uh, to the Q value function. Mm. And we remember that in the update, uh, in the update procedure for Q learning, we have to perform a maximization term uh, for constructing the target. Right, uh, but we have a large uh, action space, so so um, it's uh, it's very impractical to search through all the val valid actions through within the uh, action space. Um, so we we construct the approximate action space uh, by by looking at uh, what are the historical trips originating from uh, from the neighborhood of the current state uh, represented by by the uh, hexagon grid, um, and and those uh, those historical orders will constitute the the available uh, actions uh, for computing that maximization term. Um, and sometimes, uh, you know, due to uh, data sparsity, when you look into a particular hexagon grid, uh, there's no uh, historical data originating from that, so we have to do a, a expanded action search uh, to uh, to go to the neighboring uh, hexagon grids and and search for any available historical orders originating from there. So this is a this is a ex, uh, the expanded action search, and and uh, within this search, uh, then you have to take into account the uh, the time. That you have to you have to take going from your your current location to uh, to the search destination grid. Do action plans here is again uh, matching the assignment of demand to the driver. Yeah, yeah. For any particular driver, the action is uh, to take a particular order. And the order, you can characterize the order by its origin, its destination, right? So after taking that action, then the driver is brought to the destination. So that's a, that, that's a, that's a transition but of that. Multiple drivers and, uh, so the assignment is done, single demand versus multiple drivers? Mm, the assignment is done through, uh, through the bipartite matching. So, uh, so remember that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Action is from the single driver's perspective or global action? Um, mm, here, the action is from uh, from the single driver perspective. Because if you think about uh, the, from the global perspective, then the action space is uh, is intractable. 
because it, ha it has to be the combination of all the, all the potential match. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and this part uh, concerns with uh, terminal state values. Um, so actually, um, this uh, this goes with the same intuition as uh, uh, dynamic programming. In dynamic programming, you starting from the very end, and you uh, uh, you compute your value function uh, backwards. So here, uh, we. Uh, we uh, found that it's uh, it's very beneficial to uh, to get your the value for your terminal state action right early in this training uh, because those those values are uh, the only ones that are uh, quite deterministic in the entire uh, neural network because at the end of the day then you know for sure that the values are close to zero. Whereas for the values uh, early in the days, they all depend on the values uh, in for the later time periods. So, um, so if you get the values for uh, for the time periods that are close to the end of the day correct, then that allows you to uh, uh, to do a better uh, better propagation. So, uh, so we collect all the uh, terminal state action values. Uh, um, and and basically do uh, do the updates using uh, on the uh, terminal state action values uh, early in the training process, um, as well as uh, in every uh, we we put a we put a start uh, terminal state action values uh, in sample in every mini batch as well. Um, so this is the. Uh, this is the entire framework. Uh, you have uh, you have historical trip data, uh, and 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 you, we also perform the uh, expanded action search, which can be uh, interpreted as an imaginary experience because they didn't really happen uh, in the in the history. So uh, both type of uh, experiences will go into uh, the replay buffer. Uh, and um, and it goes through the DQN uh, process for for learning the Q value function. <coughs> um, so uh, we uh, evaluate the algorithms on on six uh, on on four cities uh, uh, in China uh, with different sizes and uh, different. Different regions, uh, and we constructed a, a single single driver test environment, and we compare uh, compare the uh, performance of DQN with uh, policy evaluation. Uh, it's it's also easy to do policy evaluation uh, in the uh, uh, in the in the in the DeepQ network framework. Uh, you just replace the max maximization of the Q term. Uh, with uh, with the uh, average queue in the mini batch updates, so so that gives you uh, the uh, policy evaluation version of it, um, and it's uh, it's similar to the so-called expect the SASA. Yeah. Uh, grids number of grids can go from uh, several hundred to several thousand. Yeah. So, so they they can differ a lot. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we actually have also built a uh, built a demo application. Uh, this is uh, really to to visualize uh, some of the dispatching uh, actions. Uh, The demo here showcases city-scale dispatching in action by a value network-based deep reinforcement learning model. The simulation environment that we are seeing here is based on real trip data from a major city in southern China. The map is implicitly divided into hex grids, each represented by two bars. 
the red bar shows the number of open trip orders, and the blue bar shows the number of available drivers. The totals of these two quantities are displayed at the top left hand side corner. The main screen provides a holistic view of the supply demand context within the five minute interval. The map can be fully zoomed and panned. The timeline at the bottom stretches from 4 pm to 10 pm and advances in steps of five minutes. We can stop at any step to examine the dispatching details. The paginated list on the left hand side shows the specifics of every dispatch trips within the current five minute window. Clicking on any of them will highlight the trip in the center map. The yellow bar connecting a blue bar to a red bar represents the pickup distance traveled by the driver for the passenger. The blue bar signifies the trip of the passenger. The corresponding pickup time and trip time are both shown in the order list. We see that while trips are varying lengths, the pickup distances are all quite short. Finally, the two curves plotted along the timeline track the platform revenue for each step generated by AI and the baseline combinatorial optimization method. Except for brief periods from 5 to 6 p.m. and from 7 to 8 p.m., AI-generated revenue is significantly higher than the baseline. <coughs> yeah, so uh, we have uh, talk about uh, order matching. So uh, let's also look, in, look at uh, the uh, driver repositioning as well. This is a work using uh, DQN for uh, solving the repositioning problem. Uh, the setup is like this. Um, it, it operates in the, in the grid world. So you discretize the map into, a, into a grids uh, and, and it performs a system-wide uh, repositioning. Uh, but uh, for for tackling this multi-agent uh, problem, uh, the, this work actually uses the independent uh, driver policy. So similar to uh, to our order matching case, that it also just learns uh, one uh, driver policy uh, for for each of the driver. So th there's less coordination. Uh, but anyway, they they have shown that uh, it it uh, it actually. Uh, it outperforms uh, one of the uh, model-based methods uh, in terms of the unfulfilled requests. Uh, so, the, so the compared baseline is a, a, a receding horizon, uh, a, a pretty a pretty classical method. Uh, yeah. So the so the agent is constructed constructed by a, a CNN-based uh, network. Uh, its input is the driver's status, uh, uh, whether it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, busy or not, and its location, uh, time, and also the projected supply and uh, demand uh, in, the, in the neighborhood. So that's, that's actually similar uh, to, to the order matching case as well. Yeah. And the action is going to a neighboring grid. Uh, Reward is a weighted sum of uh, fulfillment uh, minus pickup distance. So, uh, so we, we mentioned that for uh, for doing driver repositioning, the cost is uh, uh, the cost is really the time and gas. So, so here it uses the pickup distance to approximate that part of the cost, and subtract that from uh, from the reward, uh, and. And it assumes that the drivers um, uh, execute the actions in order. Right? Uh, yeah, the tr the training the training is done uh, within a simulation environment based on the uh, NYC taxi data, uh, which a lot of a lot of people in transportation uh, use. Mm, and uh, the training algorithm is uh, double DQN, uh, so pretty pretty standard. Uh, yeah, so this is the this is the uh, overall uh, architecture of the method. Uh, within the agent, you uh, you have a separate module for demand prediction for the supply for the for the supply as well as the demand, uh, and um, and that together with the other features, 
state features go into uh, go into the uh, the network that uh, learns the uh, the value and and in return the policy uh, and it interacts with the environment the the simulation environment to uh, to get the training uh, training data and um, so 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 far we have seen uh, several works uh, uh, dealing with uh, order matching and dispatching separately, uh, but well, we can also uh, put them into into the same framework and tackle both. So this is uh, this is a one uh, one attempt from from my group uh, trying to do that, um, and um, um, and we go beyond uh, the previous work of just representing the driver feature. Uh, using local information here, instead we use a global uh, representation. So, uh, so the each of the agent uh, it sees everything uh, within the system, uh, uh, within that city. Um, so orders are uh, represented by the six-dimensional uh, vectors: the start, starting, ending, uh, x, y positions, the coordinate positions, uh, price, and and time waiting. Uh, and driver is also represented by by uh, a vector of the same size. The uh, the position, the time to uh, complete the current order, uh, and for repositioning, uh, there's also a there's also a reposition counter. Yeah. So so the x and y, uh, the location variables, um, uh, means the different things when. Uh, uh, when, uh, when, or whether the order, uh, whether the driver is uh, available or not. So when the driver is serving the order, uh, it's uh, uh, it's the it's the ending location of the order, and um, and when the driving when the driver is available, then it's really the driver's current location uh, for uh, for a repositioning purpose. Uh, so with all the information, global information from the system, uh, in terms of orders and, and driver information, then um, how do we uh, represent it uh, so that it can be uh, consumed by uh, by the va value network? Uh, so we first we um, uh, we we embed the uh, order and drivers into uh, into memory cells. Uh, uh, represent by the purple and red uh, boxes, um, and then we we do a, a round of attention uh, to uh, to each of them to produce a global order context uh, and and global driver context vector, and those and those context vectors uh, are concatenated uh, with uh, each particular pair of driver and an order. Uh, to uh, uh, to query for the values for for that particular match, um, so so that allows us to uh, select uh, w uh, which match we should we should do next. <coughs> uh, yeah, so uh, so we 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 have two types of uh, Q values. One is uh, for uh, uh, driver order pairs and, and one for a uh, driver reposition pair, but they are they are really in the similar form, right? uh, and um, yeah. And for for reposition, uh, you have uh, nine reposition actions, uh, uh, being the eight uh, eight neighboring uh, the mid, uh, eight neighboring directions and and one uh, stationary action. So here it's a uh, uh, it's not in the uh, hexagon grid, but it's it's really represented by a square uh, square grids. Yeah. Um, so we uh, we tested in uh, in different uh, uh, curated domains to uh, uh, to demonstrate some of the uh, subtle advantage. Um, so this is a particular domain is uh, called uh, hot and cold domain. Uh, orders are only generated from 
uh, from the hot domain, uh, and they can the orders can go to a uh, hot uh, destination in the hot domain as well as uh, in the cold domain, uh, but there there are no orders uh, originating from the cold domain. So so here uh, it's really important for uh, for the for the driver agent to learn a policy that allows it to uh, reposition itself back to the hot. Uh, the, the hot area after it has finished serving the order that leads, leads the driver to the cold area. Um, and this one is called a uh, distributed domain. So uh, the way it works is that uh, there are, uh, uh, there, there's, a, there's a group of drivers uh, uh, starting from the center of the, of the map. Um, and uh, and orders can only uh, appear uh, at the two corner diagonal corners, uh, but uh, which side of the corner will have the orders is uh, is random is randomly picked uh, by the environment uh, at the at the time of uh, evaluation. So uh, so at the starting point, the drivers uh, <coughs> the drivers don't know where the orders will be. Um, um, and um, uh, and the orders can be distributed unevenly at the two at the two diagonal corners. Um, so the so the driver's policy has to be to split themselves uh, uh, at the beginning in the optimal way to uh, uh, to fulfill all of the orders to as many orders as possible. Yeah. Yeah, we also have videos for those two uh, domains, but uh, I think for for the purpose of time, uh, I'm not going to uh, show it. Uh, this is another uh, application of uh, uh, DQN for uh, for the carpooling case. Uh, but in, in in this work, uh, it's not it's not really solving the the whole carpooling problem, but really. Trying to solve uh, the uh, high-level actions uh, uh, of the of the driver uh, in the in the carpooling business. Um, uh, here, it's a it's just a very simple uh, illustration of a, a transition uh, process for for a, in the carpooling process. Uh, the driver starts from uh, D zero. <coughs> And uh, and it picks up one order at O1, goes to the second order O2, and uh, drops off the first passenger at D1, and then uh, finally finishes the, all the orders at D2, <coughs> and and at that point it becomes uh, the vehicle becomes available vacant again. Uh, so uh, so here in in our action space, uh, we uh, we want to determine at, at each step uh, whether uh, whether the system should uh, recommend the drivers to uh, to wait at the current location or uh, will just uh, assign a single order to the driver or or assign a pooled order basic uh, uh, here uh, here it means uh, two orders to the driver so so only those uh, three uh, three actions, um, and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It has it has to uh, it has to finish finish the two orders uh, in order to get a uh, get new orders. Yeah, yeah. So. So the reason why I said uh, it only solves the high-level uh, decisions is that uh, there are more granular decisions that has to that has to be made for the trip assignment. For example, uh, when when you decide that the driver should take a pulled order, uh, which which pool orders should be assigned to the driver. So uh, in this work, we uh, uh, we have left the left those decisions in uh, into the environment uh, and. And those uh, trip assignment decisions are determined by uh, fixed algorithms that tries to 
uh, minimize the tour. Uh, the reward in this case uh, is defined as the effective distance traveled uh, through one transition. So, uh, what does it mean by effective distance? Uh, uh, here's an example. Uh, if you decide to wait, then of course your uh, effective distance is zero because you haven't traveled uh, anywhere. Uh, if it's uh, to, take a, to take a single uh, passenger order, then, then the reward, the effective distance, is just the distance traveled by that order. Uh, if it's a carpool order, then the effective distance is the sum of the uh, uh, individual trip distances, not the uh, uh, the final distance traveled by the uh, by the travel driver, but the uh, the original individual distance of the trips. So the reason we set it that way is that uh, we we want to encourage uh, the policy to uh, basically to take fulfill. Um, as many uh, trip demand as possible uh, with um, with uh, uh, less amount of less amount of vehicles. Yeah. So, so this is uh, uh, to uh, evaluate uh, the policy at at two areas in the uh, using the NYC taxi data. Uh, in uptown Manhattan as well as downtown areas, yeah, uh, we have we have seen that uh, uh, DQN has has a better advantage in the uh, uptown area. Uh, for the for the downtown area, it um, it basically it performs similarly to to a fixed policy that always uh, recommends carpool. Uh, we we think that the reason is that the, in the downtown area the the orders are denser, so uh, so the optimal strategy is really uh, to uh, to always couple. Um, now let's also look at uh, some applications in traffic signals control. Uh, so this has a different different flavor from uh, from order matching and uh, driver dispatching. Uh, uh, we'll consider a single intersection uh, as well as a, a, a traffic lights network, uh, which can be a single agent or multi-agent depending on how you view it. If you view it as one single system, then it's a single agent, but with a much more uh, complicated action space. Or you can you can see it from uh, from individual traffic light point of view, then it's a multi-agent reinforcement learning. Uh, with uh, with coordination, uh, the state space uh, is typically represented by uh, position and and speed of the vehicles in the lane, um, as well as uh, queue lengths, um, and and it can be discretized or uh, uh, or or continuous. Um, uh, in some works. Um, uh, the agent actually takes uh, an image as a as an input to represent the state of the intersection. Um, the action space uh, it, it could be different in different uh, uh, in different approaches, but uh, usually it, the actions are the faces of of the traffic lights uh, or or the change of face. So. So you don't you don't determine uh, which face to uh, uh, that the traffic lights should should be at at every at every time step, but really uh, whether you need to change the face to the to the next uh, configurable face. Uh, so there are uh, in this single uh, very simple single uh, intersection there are four faces of the traffic lights: uh, the north south green. Uh, East-West screen, uh, as well as the uh, left and left turning uh, configuration for the lights. Uh, the reward uh, uh, is usually the total uh, throughput uh, at the at the intersection. How many cars that you um, uh, that you can have uh, that goes through the intersection. Uh, per unit time. Um, 
and sometimes it's uh, people defined as uh, the delay of the vehicles at the intersection. Yeah, so this is one particular work uh, that uses uh, uh, uses the DQN uh, to to solve a, a single intersection uh, TSC problem, um, and and it, the learning is done in the simulation in the in the sumo environment. Uh, sumo is very commonly used for for this type of applications. Uh, uh, we also briefly uh, look at it at, at the at the fourth section. Uh, so the state here is uh, is a lane uh, it discretized into cells. Uh, so you can think of it as in the matrix form. Uh, and in each cell of the matrix, uh, it tells you whether uh, there's a vehicle uh, in that cell uh, and what's the speed of the vehicle, um, and and as well as the uh, uh, the last action. Uh, what is the what is the signal configuration of the last time step, and and they put that into the state space as well. Uh, the the action is uh, uh, is traffic signal configurations uh, as we as we mentioned just now. Mm, there's no uh, fixed phase order, uh, so so potentially the policy can. Uh, can control the traffic lights by jumping uh, configuration order, but uh, but it has mandatory uh, uh, intermediate phases, the yellow light phase between the transitions, so that you have you have some buffer of time between uh, between the change of traffic light phase. Uh, the reward here is uh, the change in uh, cumulative vehicle delay between between the actions. Yeah, so so it's it's similar to uh, what we have laid out at previous page. Um, how is the uh, network for the for the agent constructed? Uh, it's uh, it's actually pretty uh, pretty straightforward. So there are two identical networks. Uh, so here we notice that for the input state there are uh, uh, there are real value uh, state features as well as uh, binary features, uh, whether whether the vehicle is present in the cell or not. So there are two uh, identical networks receiving these two different types of inputs. Uh, they are uh, they are CNN layers, uh, and um, and the the output the output of the CNN layers are concatenated with P, which is the last action, the last step action, uh, and then the further going through uh, the dense layers, and finally outputs the four action values. So this is a uh, this this corresponds to the original DQN uh, network architecture. You you have uh, different heads from the network correspond to the different actions, um, and they uh, they experiment with a shallow and and deep version of of the network. Uh, and let's see. Yeah, uh, and and uh, the performance comparison is uh, on the uh, on the right hand side. Within the bracket, it's a mean and uh, standard deviation. So, uh, so we see that uh, the deep network version uh, does have tangible uh, advantage. In terms of uh, uh, in terms of uh, slightly larger throughput, uh, shorter queue, uh, and uh, shorter travel time. Um, let's look at um, uh, another. Uh, application of DQN uh, in this uh, uh, TSC app problem. So, so this method uh, it has some uh, unique feature. So first of all, uh, but it's, it also considers the uh, single uh, intersection traffic lights control. Uh, uh, 
uh, it, it emphasizes policy usability. So uh, what does it mean by policy usability? If we look at uh, the diagram on the right-hand side, the policy uh, at the bottom, the third diagram, uh, shows an infeasible policy because it, it has change of action too frequent. So uh, it's not practical in the, in the real situation. So, so in the real situation, you have to maintain uh, the configuration of the traffic lights for, for a certain amount of time uh, uh, in order for the, for the traffic to be, uh, to be stable. Mm, so so this, uh, the state here uh, that they use uh, for for the agent is uh, some handcraft uh, featured for each lane. Uh, there are uh, queue lengths, number of vehicles, waiting time, uh, traffic lights face. Uh, but at the same time, they also put in an uh, image representation of the vehicle uh, positions. Uh, so those those two types of in, uh, input goes to goes into the network at the same time. Uh, the action is to change the light uh, to the next phase or keep the current phase. So, so this is an example of uh, 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 keeping a fixed configuration order, but just control uh, whether you, you change uh, the phase or not. Uh, in contrast, the previous work, it tries to, uh, uh, it tries to determine uh, what phase uh, to uh, what ways to operate for the next time step. Uh, the reward is uh, is uh, uh, is really a, a weighted sum of a number of things: uh, the queue length, delay, waiting time. So they are they are all related, uh, but in, uh, anyway, they collect all those metrics and uh, and and sum them. Uh, in a weighted manner. Uh, so one particular feature of this method is that it includes a uh, indicator of the light switch, uh, which is here. So, uh, so the so the phase gate here uh, is to make the effect of uh, uh, the tr the traffic the traffic light phase uh, more explicit. Uh, in the output of the Q value, um, so uh, so they they discover that um, for uh, if you are at different phases, then the uh, the Q value should be distinctive. But if the phase is not modeled explicitly, then sometimes it's uh, uh, it's flooded, sort of flooded by. Uh, the other features uh, in the in the input state space. Right. Uh, I th yeah. I think we the scheduled coffee break is at. 10.30, um, yeah, so we can come back maybe at uh, 10.55, since uh, right now it's uh, 10.25, uh, and, uh, and we'll, we'll continue from there. We'll go on to uh, policy-based uh, reinforcement learning and uh, multi-agent.
Okay, let's uh, continue our tutorial uh, into part three. Uh, so in this part, I'm going to uh, talk about policy-based reinforcement learning and, and beyond. Uh, so beyond here covers um, the, some of the multi-agent perspective and uh, transfer learning. Yeah, so uh, we, uh, let's, let's recap the optimization problem for uh, MDP. We want to uh, maximize the accumulative reward for, for the agent over a, a long-term horizon. Uh, and um, so, so we, a we can actually uh, uh, parameterize the policy pi uh, with the uh, parameter theta. Um, and then, uh, since the uh, cumulative reward function, it's a, it's a function of uh, the policy as well. So then now we can uh, treat the problem as a optimization problem with respect to uh, the parameters of the policy. Uh, and in that way, uh, then it's possible to do a stochastic gradient ascent because we are, we are maximizing uh, the objective function. So it's a stochastic gradient ascent uh, method to uh, 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 to um, to update the policy uh, towards the uh, optimal. Um, but in order to do so, uh, we have to we have to be able to compute the gradient, uh, which is the gradient of the uh, objective function uh, uh, with respect to the policy parameter. How do we do that? So. Uh, uh, so fortunately, uh, we have a we have a policy gradient theorem that says um, the the gradient of the objective function uh, with respect to theta, the pra uh, the parameter of the policy, uh, can be written in the uh, in the analytical form, uh, which is basically uh, you know you sum over. Uh, uh, some of the old actions uh, for the product of the Q value function and the gradient of the policy with respect to its parameter, uh, and then you uh, 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 basically you you sum over you take a you take an expectation the the mu uh, pi of s it's the the distribution of the state under the policy pi, yeah, so so it's uh, it's really it's really an expectation, the, the gradient of the policy. Uh, now let's take a further look at uh, the policy gradient. Uh, so I said uh, it, it looks like an expectation. So yes, we can, uh, we can write it uh, more concisely uh, in terms of the expectation symbol. Uh, by uh, basically uh, absorbing absorbing the mu pi term and and the summation over all the states, uh, and well, we can do some further massaging and uh, and uh, replace a by the action uh, that's taken at time t. So so the reason why uh, it's it's replaced by a capital A T is that the action at time T it's a it's a random variable. So uh so it's really it's a random variable here. And um and we see that we have divided uh the uh, gradient of the policy term by uh pi itself. So by right then we need to multiply the pi somewhere here, but uh it's not there. Why? Because uh because the the distribution the distribution of the random variable capital A T it's governed by the policy uh, pi uh, A T given uh, S T and theta, so so it can it can be absorbed into the expectation uh, under pi, so uh, so you end up with uh, something like that on the right hand side, uh, the expectation under pi of the product of the uh, Q uh, value function and, uh, and the gradient, uh, the derivative of log pi with respect to the, the, the parameter of the, of the policy. Um, 
Now, uh, in order to make it a more practical, uh, a practic more practical term for updating, then uh, we can uh, we can replace uh, the q pi the q value function uh, with the uh, Monte Carlo sample version. So, so then we are doing uh, MC learning if we use uh, GT to uh, replace q pi. Uh, we remember GT is the uh, the sample based cumulative rewards. Uh, so, so this this gives us the uh, uh, the famous policy gradient uh, algorithm reinforce. So it's really a MC policy gradient method. Uh, being an MC method, you have to use uh, four trajectories, four episodes. <coughs> um, and typically, uh, we also use a, uh, include a baseline uh, in the uh, in the reinforce updates, uh, which is a B the B term here. Uh, the reason why we use the baseline is to reduce the variance of uh, uh, the sample gradient, and, and which can also speed up learning. Um, so what? But what do we? What should we use to uh, to represent the baseline? So one. Uh, but the, uh, note we note that the baseline has to be uh, independent from action uh, in order not to. Uh, modify, modify the ultimate value of the expectation term. So, so it's it's uh, it's a function of the state, but uh, it has to be independent from the action. Yeah. So, uh, so there's one natural choice that's that's just the estimate of the uh, state value itself, the the v value function. It's uh, independent from the action, but it's a function of the state. Um, and if we if we use a neural network for function approximation, then we further have another uh, parameter w. Um, so if we if we do that, then the update term uh, will be will be in red. Yeah, and uh, and reinforce uh, we see that it's also a, a SGD the sto stochastic gradient descent method. Um, and and it's a uh, it's an MC method, so so it may uh, it may suffer from high variance, uh, uh, and that's why uh, that's why we use uh, we need a baseline for mitigation. Um, now, uh, in one of the previous slides. Um, I lay out the different types of uh, policy-based uh, uh, reinforcement learning methods. Um, so alongside with the uh, uh, policy gradient method, we have actor critic methods, uh, which learns uh, both the, the policy and uh, value at the same time. Uh, the critic here is really an estimate of the value term uh, to to you uh, to be used in the approximation of the gradient, because uh, we, we remember that in the uh, in the expectation term for the gra policy gradient we have a uh, we have a Q term, uh, which is a value. So we can we can learn uh, use function approximation to learn the Q value for uh, for Q pi, uh, and uh, if we uh, if we use a baseline version. Uh, which we uh, subtract the state value from from q pi uh, in the expectation, uh, then we can also uh, subtract. Uh, we can also substitute this part, the q minus v part, uh, by the TD error. Uh, because because if we look into the TD error, the sum of the first two terms is the approximation of the q. Uh, of the Q function, and uh, the third term is the V function itself. So, so it's a it's a sample uh, approximation of of the uh, difference term in the baseline version. Uh, now, how do we how do we estimate the value function? Uh, assuming we use a linear function approximation. 
then our Q function can be written as the feature vector, the inner product of the feature vector and your parameter vector. So, uh, so we can write down a pretty simple uh, linear TD0 update uh, uh, for, uh, for minimizing the least squares objective. Right. Oh, and, by, uh, and we see that this is a, a on policy method uh, because, uh, because er everywhere uh, you can just follow the, uh, follow the uh, uh, transition in the trajectory. Uh, and you don't have to do uh, maximization term as in the Q-learning case. Uh, yeah, so uh, we talked about how uh, we can approximate uh, the, uh, the difference term in the expectation for the policy gradient. Um, and and we, uh, if we record the way uh, we, we uh, construct the edge weights, in the order matching uh, method, I mentioned that we use the uh, advantage to compute the edge weight. And that's exactly uh, the, th the thing that we are going to talk about here. So the advantage uh, of a state and action uh, is defined by the difference between uh, the Q value and uh, the state value. So, so you can think of it as the, uh, the relative uh, uh, that's why it's called advantage. It's a, it's a relative uh, uh, increase in the value by taking that particular action as, as versus to the average case. Because the, the state value function, it's it, it marginalized over the action. So it's, it's really an average case. Right? So, so that's why it's called value fun uh, the advantage function. Um, and then we see that it's in a nice form to be uh, readily substitute into the difference term in the expectation. Uh, so, so you can actually you can actually learn a uh, advantage uh, to uh, uh, to construct your policy gradient, and that gives you the advantage after critics, so called A two C. Yeah. So in this case, then our critic is the critic's job is to uh, learn the advantage function. Uh, you can. There are different ways to. Uh, learn the advantage, you can uh, uh, maintain approximation <coughs> to both Q and V, uh, uh, updating using uh, temporal difference. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, if you do that, then that, that becomes the TDAC. Uh, of course, you can, you can use uh, the end step version. Uh, and um, yeah, and, and, uh, and it's in this case, the the state value is also updated using um, uh, using TD learning. Uh, so, so as a recap, um, for for policy gradient methods, uh, we can learn a Q value function without baseline to construct policy gradient. Uh, we can learn the state value V value function, and then the computer TD error. Uh, to uh, to put into the expectation term for the for the policy gradient, uh, we can we can also learn the advantage uh, to uh, to get the A two C method. Uh, now, this one uh, is called A three C. So there's an extra A in front, the uh, asynchronous version of A two C. It uses uh, deep neural networks again, deep neural networks to for function approximation of the policy and value, the pi and v. Uh, it um, yeah, it uses the forward view of the n-step uh, bootstrap approximation for the advantage. So it's it's uh, the n-step would be uh, something like uh, here. Uh, you roll out uh, n steps of uh, transitions in the trajectory and uh, use the realized uh, reward to compute the sample version of the advantage. Uh, and and it, since it's an asynchronous version of, uh, of the A2C method, uh, it, it's in the implementation of it uh, is, is multi-thread. Uh, multi 
So, uh, so the parameters of the uh, actor and critic um, are updated within each uh, thread and uh, synchronized with the global copy. Uh, so basically, if, if within each thread, you have an uh, instance of the environment, and uh, you have the agent interacting with the environment uh, for, for updates. Uh, uh, but at the same time, uh, you also synchronize with the global copy through a, uh, a two, uh, after completing an episode. Yeah. Uh, so, so we see that uh, this kind of implementation, it can be done uh, on, the, uh, on a single machine with uh, multiple cores. Uh, whereas uh, for, uh, for the original uh, A2C or uh, DQN method, then uh, typically people have to use uh, uh, their GPU cards. <coughs> So it's, uh, it's a comparison of uh, using, using a GPU uh, for DQN and uh, for uh, one-step Q, one-step SASA, different variants of the Q learning and SASA, uh, and then uh, running A3C uh, on a, on a multi-core uh, CPU machine. Uh, so so you, uh, the, the yellow line is for A3C, and you see that um, it actually uh, shows uh, demonstrable advantage uh, on a number of uh, Atari instances. Um, we, um, so when we were talking about policy, uh, we said that uh, there are uh, deterministic policy as well as stochastic policy. We we have covered uh, stochastic policy. policy. Uh, for deterministic policy, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a corresponding version for the policy gradient theorem. So, so for deterministic policy, you can also write down uh, the, the analytical form for computing the policy gradient as well, uh, uh, basically by applying the chain rule to, uh, uh, to the expectation. the gradient, the gradient of the QL function with respect to the, the policy parameters. Uh, now, uh, in this case, how do we uh, update uh, the policy? Um, actually, uh, we can use the same kind of idea from uh, DQN, uh, uh, specifically using uh, experience, re experience replay buffer and the target Q network. Uh, we have talked about why uh, we have to use, use those uh, two features. Uh, one is to uh, break the correlation between the transi training transition experience, and the other one, the target queue network, is, uh, is to stabilize training. Right? So within the same, within the same uh, framework, uh, uh, we, can, we can construct a uh, deep neural network version of the uh, uh, deterministic policy gradient method um, by maintaining uh, by maintaining a neural network for uh, for the policy as well as for the Q function. <coughs> well, so let's look at uh, several applications in uh, role planning. Uh, so there are, there are two pieces of work that I'm, that I'm going to talk about. One is uh, on using DIL for uh, path planning and, and mapping, and uh, the other one is uh, is for navigation uh, under a photorealistic simulation environment. <coughs> uh, so this particular work, um, it. Uh, constructs a, uh, a neural network based agent uh, to uh, learn to read the map and n navigate. So, so it has uh, both the uh, visual uh, input as well as the map uh, input. And, um, uh, and it's designed in the modular, uh, in the modular fashion. So uh, each, uh, each module pretty much uh, 
is trained uh, independently, and there's uh, there's no uh, uh, back propagation happening uh, across module boundaries. So the uh, advantage is that uh, each module can be uh, uh, evaluated and uh, debugged separately, and you have smaller tasks, and uh, you have to deal with uh, uh, the shorter credit assignment paths. So it makes the learning uh, easier than uh, uh, than uh, updating the entire system as a single entity. <coughs> yeah. uh, so some uh, explanation to, uh, to the architecture here. Uh, so uh, we have uh, uh, the, the visual input goes into uh, the visible uh, local map network. So it takes uh, the raw uh, visual input uh, from the 3D environment. Um, uh, yeah, and uh, for the recurrent uh, localization cell, then uh, it takes uh, streams of uh, uh, the, uh, the output of the visible, uh, the visible local map network uh, embeddings, and then um, uh, and then in integrates it into a local map estimation, yeah. And the map interpretation network is uh, basically it takes the input of the map and tries to uh, uh, tries to uh, in interpret the map and outputs a uh, it outputs a short term target direction for for estimate positions. And and your uh, your agent is here, the reactive agent. So this one uh, outputs the policy as well as the uh, value, the V value. Yeah, so, so it consists of uh, different modules. So uh, uh, the, the training uh, partially on policy and off policy for the different modules. Uh, and um, and you also maintain the replay buffer. Uh, you push experience of each step into the replay buffer, um, and, um, and and frames are sampled. Yeah, uh, to uh, basically to compute the uh, loss for the visible uh, local map as well as the reward map. Um, the training environment is done in the uh, Deep DeepMind lab. Uh, so. So this is this is uh, like an example of uh, how what it looks like uh, from from the agent's perspective. Yeah, but from the god's view, uh, you you uh, you are really seeing the ma uh, a maze, and then uh, the red lines correspond to the trajectory taken by the agents. Um, the training algorithm here uh, is HVC. Uh, so it allows it to uh, to done uh, to be done uh, in a uh, multi-thread fashion, um, and and we can also uh, see the results here that uh, the performance measured by the number of steps to uh, solve the maze um, it's actually quite robust as uh, as the maze size increases. Uh, on average, it it does not uh, increase by a lot. Um, uh, this is another work um, for navigation uh, without a map, uh, and and the environment here is uh, uh, is a is a Google Street View environment. Uh, at each node, you have a, a Panoramic images uh, representing what you can see uh, as if as if the agent was standing at that at that part of the road, yeah. um, and the, and the space of the nodes are uh, ten meters, uh, and the environment covers about five kilometers. Uh, input to the agent uh, it's the both uh, the uh, the image that the agent sees. Uh, in the environment as well as uh, uh, the goal landmarks. So the, there are there are several uh, goals that's distributed uh, around the map. Um, 
and it's represented by uh, the distances of the agent, the distance of the agent to each of the landmark, and and that forms part of the input to the agent. Uh, the agent takes a discrete set of actions, uh, and um, and it starts from the random lo uh, start location. Uh, and each, each episode has uh, 1,000 steps. Um, so uh, I want to talk a little bit about the architecture of the network over there. Uh, it employs a dual pathway uh, network. Uh, we'll see later that this, ki this kind of uh, architecture actually facilitates very well uh, transfer learning, because here, uh, for each city, you have a uh, you have a different environment set up, and um, and you don't want to uh, learn from scratch for each of the new city that you encounter. So you want to you want to learn a general network that can be adapted to uh, a different environment very quickly. Uh, so that's that's why they are. Uh, they come up with uh, uh, this kind of a dual pathway. Um, one pass is um, uh, so so the the policy uh, LSTM it goes it goes here. Uh, you have the your state as input goes to the uh, LSTM layers and outputs the policy and uh, value, and uh, this is a goal vector um, and. Uh, it actually uh, it has it has an output that uh, that tries to perform an auxiliary prediction task, that is uh, to predict the agent's heading angle uh, for the uh, which which is data. So the auxiliary uh, training task uh, it helps. It helps uh, um, training the network uh, faster, um, and it, it uses a framework uh, called curricular learning. Uh, that's very intuitive, from the name suggests. Uh, basically, it gradually gradually increases the complexity of the learning task uh, by choosing uh, more and more difficult examples. So we'll, we'll come back to this example when we are talking about transfer learning. So here, uh, uh, this, is, this architecture setup is for learning uh, the navigation policy within, uh, within one city. Uh, when we are facing multiple city scenario, then uh, this architecture is very, uh, is very convenient to uh, expand into those uh, situations. Um, let's uh, uh, switch into a different <coughs> type of application, uh, autonomous driving control. Uh, so here, we want to we want to use uh, deep reinforcement learning for uh, control a vehicle uh, which drives by itself. Right? So the control policy is really is really important um, for uh, uh, you know for the smooth driving as well as for safety. <coughs> so the car, the car control policy um, has basically has two types uh, in the literature. Uh, either either you learn the policy to try to take the full control of the vehicle uh, by controlling steering, uh, braking, and acceleration. So there are multiple dimensions that you have to uh, your policy have to set uh, for the control. Uh, or uh, in the sim in the simpler case, then. Uh, the policy un only controls the uh, the lateral movement. Yeah. Mm. Most of the work so far um, has been uh, gameplays in the simulation environment. Uh, so essentially, uh, you are learning a policy that's trying to uh, play uh, control a car to uh, play, for example, a car racing uh, game in the simulation environment. Mm. And there are uh, different types of 
driving paths uh, that uh, that the the learning we're trying to uh, uh, we're trying to learn the policy for. Uh, so there are, uh, for example, there are path tracking, uh, lane change, uh, and among others. So, uh, so this is uh, this is the one work that's uh, using uh, DDPG, the deep deterministic policy gradient, uh, to uh, to learn a policy for full control. So the so the state is sensory data input. Uh, so this is in contrast to uh, a more conventional state input uh, form that is image. Uh, this is uh, sensory data, so so it tracks the uh, the angle of your of your heading, uh, and uh, and it has your range finder sensors as well as track position and speed. So so it's uh, the state features are input as real numbers, multi-dimensional real numbers into the uh, into the agent. Um, the the agent action is. Um, it tries to uh, learn the policy to control the uh, acceleration, brake, and slow. So it's a, it's a three-dimensional continuous uh, action space. Um, how do you, com how do you uh, construct a reward? Uh, you want to uh, encourage faster, uh, uh, faster driving along the uh, axis, uh, but you want to discourage uh, deviation from the track. So, uh, so speed along the axis is a positive reward, and speed vertical to the axis is a negative reward in this case, um, and, um, and deviation from track is also a negative reward. Um, yeah, so uh, I mentioned uh, the training algorithm is DDPG, uh, and, um, and the environment is talks. Uh, so we also see uh, see it briefly in the in the final section. Uh, it's basically a, a, a very photorealistic uh, driving simulation driving environment for uh, for training uh, self driving policies. Uh, and for network architecture, uh, so it's shown on the right hand side. Um, since it's DDPG, then you have to construct both the uh, actor and uh, critic networks. Uh, so here, it doesn't look like uh, uh, there's any anything fancy about it. So mostly, uh, mostly uh, it's it's um, uh, dense networks. Uh, but that that also makes sense because the the input are uh, continuous uh, real variables uh, instead of images. So. Yeah, so uh, so it uses dense networks. Uh, this is this is uh, uh, another another work that employs uh, DDPG uh, in in the <coughs> game playing scenario for controlling a car. Mm. So, so the design here is a bit different. It has a, it has a modular design. Uh, so, yeah, so it separates the perception and control modules, and uh, and and those two modules are trained separately. Uh, the perception module, uh, it's trained through a multitask learning framework. Uh, this is try to uh, improve the generalization performance of of the perception module. Uh, it has a driver view image as input, um, and um, uh, and the multiple tasks here in this framework is to uh, predict uh, different track features, uh, for example, a vehicle location and pose. Um, so so uh, uh, you can predict uh, distance to lane markings, uh, you know the uh, angle between the track and vehicle heading, uh, and also. Um, Try to classify uh, different track types. Uh, yeah. So, so this training framework trains the uh, perception module, uh, which consumes the uh, the input image and um, it outputs both the track features and and also I believe the 
um, the embedding as well. Uh, now for the control module, uh, different from uh, the previous work, uh, it only controls the uh, lateral movement. So, uh, so the control module it takes the input from uh, from camera sensor as well as the uh, the track features from the perception module, um, and um, yeah, and since you are. Uh, you are controlling the lateral movement. It's a continuous state and continuous action uh, scenario. And uh, and the agent is trying to minimize the uh, the yaw angle uh, to keep the vehicle on track. So the yaw angle is defined that way. The uh, yeah, I believe it's a, it's a theta. Yeah, so so it's an angle uh, between the car heading and and the horizontal line. Um, and and the agent network that the, that this works uses is very uh, similar to DDPG. Uh, you have you have your input, uh, the uh, track features and image uh, here, and then uh, you have two trains of uh, network blocks, or well, one one for uh, one for the uh, policy and the other one for the for the Q value. <coughs> Um, for uh, specific uh, driving tasks, uh, uh, we have several works uh, based on uh, uh, DIL as well. So this is for uh, lane, specifically for lane change maneuvers. Uh, so, so the controllers, uh, the controllers here uh, consists of uh, three. Uh, three modules and the reinforcement learning it, it just controls the lateral com uh, the lateral component of the control uh, longitudinal control and gap selection it's done by uh, separate modules <coughs> so again um, uh, the agent uh, sees the state uh, of uh, the the vehicle speed uh, longitudinal action uh, position your angle so the, the basically the usual uh, usual system configuration properties uh, and and the action is to uh, is to control the your acceleration of the vehicle mm. and and the reward uh, takes into two factors into account uh, both smoothness of um, of the ter of, of the lane change maneuver and um, and the efficiency, like how much time that you take to to change lane. Yeah. Uh, you mean neighboring cars? Yeah, like mm. the car on the neighbor like on the target and one or two. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, yeah, I think that's that's probably uh, taken into account by the gap selection module. So so that's that's where you have to uh, uh, you have to uh, consider uh, cars in the in the neighboring lanes in order to select a appropriate gap, right? Uh, but Yeah, I, I, I agree. Um, I think here um, the gap selection module, it, it, uh, in order to determine uh, the appropriateness of the gap, it, it has to take into account the, the speed of the uh, vehicles in the neighboring lane, so that so that you can be sure that that, that gap is uh, is a is a good one. Uh, 
to, to perform the um, maneuver. Because here, uh, their uh, reinforcement learning controller is just to, just to do the lane change maneuver uh, so that you can do it smooth. Um, yeah, they, they construct the Q function uh, in, a sp in a specific form, uh, in actually quadratic in action. This is a, uh, to make it such that uh, the, the greedy action it happens to have a closed form solution. Um, and um, uh, so far we have seen uh, several works that's trained and tested all in simulation environment. And I think this, this is one of the works, a few works that actually uh, deployed the uh, reinforcement learning trend policy on the real car um, and, and test it on, on the real road. Uh, it, it's, it's for doing the lane following task. Uh, so uh, being in the real world, it, then it has uh, no access to the, to the ground truth as in the game plane. So in game plane, you, can, you have access to the uh, underlying system uh, properties, like the sensory uh, data. But uh, in the real world, you don't, you don't have access to that. Uh, for example, you don't know the, uh, the angle of the car to the lane. Um, so, so basically, you, uh, you rely on uh, the uh, uh, camera image. Uh, and, and they have a version that's, uh, that uses the, that use the variational autoencoder to uh, compress the uh, representation. Um, and and you have the uh, observed vehicle speed, the steering angle. Um, action is, is steering angle between uh, uh, minus one and one. Um, and, and reward is your, your forward reward speed, uh, the forward speed of your vehicle. Yeah. And the episode is terminated when uh, traffic rules are violated. So that's... Uh, uh, Compliance to traffic rules is uh, highly encouraged. Yeah, and then you, they use DDPG. Uh, they add they add some uh, discrete uh, Austin Wallenberg uh, the process noise to uh, to do exploration. So uh, yeah, this is how the it's actually a simple route uh, uh, about uh, about two hundred meters, I think. It's not a it's not a very complicated pass, but uh, uh, by anyway. They so does it end with a negative reward at least? Uh, sorry. I mean that that the learning episode always ends with a negative reward, right? Uh, no, not necessarily because the uh, uh, reward is forward. So every time step it receives a reward, but the episode ends when it violates the rule. Uh, episode ends when. Uh, Traffic, uh, you know, it, it deviates from the track and go go to the boundary of the of the road. So then that, that terminates the episode. Or of course, when you reach the destination. Yeah. yeah. So uh, so that concludes the uh, the policy opera uh, optimization part, uh, and um, and we'll. Take also take a look at uh, what happens when we are dealing with multiple agents in the environment. So that's a multi-agent reinforcement learning model. Uh, so previously, um, our uh, state space consists of the state of only a single agent. And here, uh, the state space is much larger. Uh, it has to account for the state for all of the agents. Um, and, and each agent has a partial observation of the uh, entire system state. And, and each, at each step, then uh, each agent chooses the action uh, by its own policy, pi i, and, and its action uh, a i. Right? Um, and we have, a, we have a joint policy. So the joint policy is the collection of 
the policies for all of the agents from pi i, pi 1 to pi n. Um, and correspondingly, we have a joint action that's the collection of all the action taken by uh, each of the agent. Um, and, and then the next state, uh, now it's uh, determined by uh, the transition probability that, um, uh, that that's depend on the state of the system and uh, the joint action taken by each of the agent. And that gives you the distribution on the next state. Uh, the reward function also, um, it, it depends on the joint action as well. So, so that's where the complexity comes in. Right? You have to, uh, in the exact form, you have to consider the joint action space of all of the agents. Uh, each agent maximizes its own uh, uh, discounted uh, cumulative rewards. Um, but we'll see later for cooperation, then you, know, you have to, uh, sometimes you have to, uh, you have to uh, t tweak the reward function to uh, encourage co uh, cooperation. Um, so similar to a single agent case, we have uh, similar definitions for, uh, for the Q and the V uh, value functions uh, defined on the joint action space um, and, and also the policy gradient and uh, determines the policy gradient. Um, now for applications in, um, uh, in transportation, uh, the problems are usually uh, cooperative. Um, for example, for uh, uh, in our case for order matching, then uh, we want the, actually want the agents to uh, co cooperate each other uh, to, in order to maximize a, uh, a collective objective. So, um, so there are, there are a number of challenges uh, to induce coordination. Uh, among the agents. Uh, so first of all, you know, your policy has to know each other, the agent states, or, or you have to know the global state of, of, uh, of all the agents. Um, and you need to have the visibility to the joint policy as well. You need to know um, what the other agents action, what they are doing. Um, because uh, uh, of course, for for a simple uh, for a simple solution to the multi-agent environment, you can independently learn a policy for each uh, for each agent. But in that case, then uh, if you disregard uh, the action from the other agents, then you are essentially facing a non-stationary environment because the other's policy might be changing. Um, so so your environment is not is not stationary and that. Uh, that poses a, a problem for uh, for learning a, a policy for the current agent. Yeah. Um, so there are there are a number of uh, uh, you know different measures to uh, to induce coordination. Um, so uh, in terms of state, uh, uh, there are works uh, trying to uh, augment. The, the agent observation to basically to include the other agent's uh, state information. Uh, or uh, for actions, then uh, you, do, you do the training in the central manner um, so, that, so that you can share the training experiences from among the uh, agents. Um, and, um, and you can also approximate or, or infer the policies from other agents as well. There are some representative works um, uh, we'll, we'll look into uh, the mean field uh, method in particular. <coughs> oh, you, can, you can design specific reward function uh, to, to reflect a global objective as versus a, uh, uh, a selfish objective for each individual agent. Um, communication is important uh, because the uh, agents have to have to share information about their respective state information as well as uh, what they are doing. Uh, so, um, so uh, 
there are works that uh, include communication channels between agents, uh, have messages passed around. Um, yeah, there, there are uh, several representative works, uh, ComNet, uh, the, uh, the DIO framework, and, and the bidirectionally coordinated net. But yeah, I won't go into uh, details for those. Um, and if you're interested, can look into the references. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so for coordination uh, among the agents, there's a uh, particular method that's that have been uh, used quite a lot uh, for applications in uh, uh, traffic lights control. So, uh, in this method. Uh, we construct a coordination graph uh, that describes the dependencies between between the agents. So if you uh, yeah, if you have dependency between two agents, there's, uh, there's the edge between uh, those two nodes. Um, um, and and for solving uh, the optimal joint action, uh, then it employs a, a so-called max plus algorithm. Uh, what it does is essentially to uh, iteratively to uh, uh, send a locally optimized message uh, between the connected nodes. Uh, so here, uh, the uh, the uh, QIJ is is a pairwise uh, uh, pairwise value function between the agent I and J, uh, and and this this whole update. The mu ij it basically approximates uh, the maximal value uh, the maximal value that agent i can achieve for uh, each of the action that agent j can execute. Uh, so then it can derive the uh, uh, the optimal action for for agent i, uh, and. Um, and it, it converges to the uh, optimal action in, in finite iterations. Yeah. But theoretically, only for a tree structure uh, coordination graph. But empirically, uh, people have seen that it works for graphs that contain cycles as well. Uh, so this is uh, uh, one of the first work uh, that considers traffic lights control uh, within, a, within a network uh, for multiple intersections. Uh, but it, it uh, employs a, simpli uh, a quite stylized and simplistic uh, car behavior model, um, and, um, and also discretized lanes and times. Um, so, so it employs a car-based value function. What does it mean? Uh, it means that um, the the value function it it tries to compute the total uh, discounted expected wait time uh, for each car uh, in the system before reaching the destination. So so your reward is really the uh, the uh, the wait time for the for the car in the system. Um, and, and this is a this is a Q value function. Uh, for this method, like uh, your position, destination, uh, traffic light, and and the action. The action is uh, basically just uh, turning the light to red or green, um, and um, and in order to de decide uh, what action to take at a particular intersection, it computes the, uh, the so-called gain, which is which is a difference between the Q value function for a red light and uh, the green light. Yeah. And, um, and for a particular intersection, a junction, then you, uh, you sum up the games for all the cars at a, at a node, um, and then select a, a action that maximizes this sum of, uh, sum of values. Now, um, this is a so the, uh, this definition of Q function. Uh, it does not take into account any other information from the neighbors or or the other agents. So, 
Uh, so uh, it it develops gradually uh, several methods that uh, takes more and more uh, information uh, among the among the neighbors to uh, uh, in order to induce coordination. So uh, so you can uh, take partial information sharing, uh, which comes in the form of the number of cars. Uh, waiting at the next possible traffic lights, uh, in order to uh, in order to compute the transition probability of the of the first car. So, so what it does is uh, in the transition probability, it it puts in the extra uh, input of the number of cars waiting at the next the next traffic light. So this gives you uh, some implicit information about. Uh, the traffic condition of of the neighbor, and uh, and con and taking to that into consideration uh, when you are when you are computing the transition probability. Um, and going to going to uh, the extreme is to uh, do global knowledge sharing. So so then uh, it uses the global information to compute the wait times for all of the cars. So that, that basically makes your transition probability uh, even more complicated. Uh, so that, that's one way of uh, inducing coordination in a, a multi-agent system. Uh, this is to uh, modify your transition probability function uh, to take into account extra information from the neighbors. Uh, and um, and this this work takes in uh, takes a different approach for for coordination. Uh, so instead of modifying the uh, transition probability function, it, it uh, uses the uh, the max plus algorithm together with the uh, coordination graph that uh, that I mentioned just now. Um, and for for a traffic light system, it's actually uh, quite natural to construct a uh, coordination graph because uh, uh, your road network uh, will basically just give you the structure of the network. Any two intersections that are connected by a road is connected by an edge in a coordination graph. Um, and and then. And then you can uh, you can compute uh, the necessary quantities, the the pairwise uh, Q value functions, uh, uh, for use in the uh, the max plus algorithm. Um, this is a this is a uh, a work that uh, tries to solve a coordinated controller for multiple intersections uh, using DQN. Uh, so again, it also uses the coordination graph and uh, max plus algorithm uh, to optimize the joint uh, action. Uh, it uses a particular uh, method called transfer planning. Uh, what it does is uh, that it, it learns a Q value function for uh, for a subproblem of a large, larger multi-agent problem, um, and then uh, you reuse the Q-value <coughs> function learned uh, for each similar subproblem. So, uh, so here, uh, for example, for uh, uh, you can you can learn the pairwise value function uh, for two uh, neighboring traffic lights, and then. Uh, and then, uh, then you learn the rotator version of it, and then you can uh, you can basically uh, re reuse that uh, in the in the four intersection network in that way. Um, we have seen that. Uh, for tackling multi-agent uh, reinforcement learning, uh, one big challenge is the number of agents in the system. So uh, when the number of agents grows large, then your joint action space quickly go, uh, goes intractable. Uh, 
so that's why it's uh, it's hard to uh, learn a joint value function exactly in that situation. Uh, but there are approximation methods to uh, mitigate that problem. Uh, so first of all, we can uh, we can decompose the global Q value function uh, by a pairwise interaction, uh, and then and then uh, it's approximated by a mean agent. So so we'll see how that how that goes. Uh, so so basically, you de decompose the Q uh, by as as the average. Uh, of the the agent, the interaction of the agent with one neighbor. So then, uh, so then you sum up uh, the pairwise interaction of all all of the neighbors uh, and and take a mean. So that's approximately. Uh, then you can you can construct a a mean action from the mean agent. So it approximates the. Uh, the behavior of uh, all of your neighbors by an abstract mean agent. So that allows you to come back to a pairwise uh, interaction, simple pairwise interaction situation. So that, that greatly uh, simplifies uh, the, training, the training process. And then after you do that, then uh, uh, you can go with the usual uh, usual way of uh, updating your uh, pairwise uh, pairwise joint action value function. So, uh, so we'll talk about one uh, particular application here in uh, order matching. Uh, so here we we consider uh, each agent uh, as a driver. So then, uh, in you can imagine in this system you have you have a lot of uh, agents, um, and their goal is to maximize uh, the total uh, total income and uh, fulfillment rate. So you want to you want to uh, fulfill as many uh, orders in the system as possible collectively. Uh, so typically, we are in the situation that uh, the orders exceed the number of drivers. So, um, uh, so this really comes down to finding an optimal uh, order choice for each driver. Um, and uh, we uh, proposed a multi-agent RL uh, framework uh, here. In the centralized training and decentralized execution manner, uh, centralized training means that uh, all of the all of the training uh, experiences are shared uh, in the uh, in the uh, algorithm among all the agents uh, to learn their uh, actor and critic functions. Uh, but uh, when you are uh, when you are applying your policies executing the actions uh, it's done can be done in a decentralized manner uh, one advantage of this this kind of uh, uh, paradigm is that then uh, you can uh, you can avoid a, a central point of failure single point of failure when you are uh, executing your actions So uh, one challenge here is that uh, the population size is uh, changing. Um, so at each decision point, uh, w uh, what the system actually sees is all the drivers who are online, who have been turned on their uh, app and, um, and uh, set their uh, status to be ava available to accept orders. Uh, and that number changes from time to time, so your population size is changing. Uh, yeah. And your action set is also changing, uh, because uh, apparently uh, you have a different set of orders at different times. So, so, the, so the set of possible actions that the agents can execute uh, is also different from time to time. 
Uh, so in order to tackle those two problems, uh, the mean field part uh, would solve the changing population size problem because uh, you represent your neighbors by a mean agent. So that's a fixed number of uh, agent. It becomes, it becomes a pairwise uh, situation. Um, and uh, to tackle the uh, variable action set problem, uh, the way that we, uh, that we derive the policy after we learn the value is that um, uh, we, we learn, basically we learn the Q value function uh, for a, each pair of uh, order and, uh, and driver. And then um, uh, within each decision time interval, for all of the possible orders and available drivers, then you can, you can apply that value function to query, basically query each possible pair, uh, and then select the, uh, uh, the best action using a Boltzmann machine. Um, so this is uh, just uh, show some uh, visualization of the results. Uh, I think, yeah, I think here, yeah, it's uh, it's showing uh, the supply uh, supply demand disparity. Uh, this is basically, mm, let's see, answer. Yeah, yeah, so so this is uh, trying to show that uh, with coordination, then you have uh, less number of orders unserved um, as a result. So so collectively, uh, the drivers are able to uh, serve more orders than uh, than when they are they have their uh, policies uh, independently from each other. Uh, but we, we do that in the, also in a grid-based uh, simulator. Yeah. Uh, apart from multi-agent uh, multi environment, uh, let's also look at uh, another aspect uh, in, the, uh, in the training of the agents. That's uh, for transfer learning. So, so transportation, a lot of transportation applications has this uh, need to uh, transfer knowledge from city to city. Because, uh, for example, if you are uh, training a policy, order matching policy for uh, different cities, then you want to quickly uh, transfer the knowledge that you gained from training in one city and uh, reuse in the other cities. So transfer learning becomes useful uh, in this manner. Um, because the, so the main idea is to uh, reuse the weights uh, from the models that we have already trained. Um, and, and that uh, possibly gives you a better initial solution and, and faster training for better learning results. Uh, there are some uh, existing methods for transfer learning. Uh, one is called fine tuning. So that's just uh, you. Uh, take a trained network and, uh, and uh, plug into a new environment and, uh, uh, and, and continue to train from there. Um, and a second type of method is called progressive. So, so here, uh, in your target network, you construct in the dual pathways architecture. Um, and uh, uh, you take you take a, f a trained uh, network from a source city and, uh, and fix it and put it into your target network. And, um, and the blue parts are your targets, uh, the, the network blocks for the target city. And you con uh, create connections between the source city blocks and target cities. Uh, but in the training for the new city, uh, you only update the blue part. Uh, and keeping the green part fixed. So, uh, so this allows you to uh, use uh, some of the information extracted from the existing trained model. <coughs> uh, 
So this is a, a recap of um, our uh, DQM method. Uh, basically, uh, we uh, we have a state representation that uh, uh, represents the location time of the, of the driver as well as uh, supply demand contextual information in the neighborhood. And um, so we take an approach that's similar to the progressive uh, transfer learning architecture. Uh, so specifically, we design uh, the architecture of the network for the source city uh, in the dual pathway uh, architecture to allow easy transfer. So in this way, uh, since your original network has two trains of blocks, then um, when you are doing transfer, you just take the corresponding part and plug into uh, the network for the target city. Uh, but uh, we have to separate uh, the source, uh, separate the input uh, state features into two groups. So uh, one, is for, uh, one is for those state features that are transferable. Uh, basically, they are um, uh, general across the cities. And the other group is for like city specific features. Uh, for example, the, uh, the location of the drivers. So uh, the, the locations are very specific to uh, specific cities. And the general uh, features that are transferable are like uh, number of idle drivers, uh, number of orders created among the neighborhood, uh, average pickup time. So they are, they are generic uh, across cities and they are transferable. So they go into, uh, they go into the F part of the uh, input. Uh, we, we carry out uh, experiment for uh, doing spatial transfer as well as a temporal transfer. Spatial transfer is easy to understand. You just transfer from uh, one city to another. Uh, uh, temporal transfer is uh, for transfer uh, a train model, uh, train model uh, for an earlier uh, time period to uh, a new model for the later time period. Yeah. So uh, we have seen that uh, in in some cases, uh, transfer learning provides a better uh, initial solution. Uh, here, uh, the blue lines correspond to the, uh, uh, the method that uh, utilizes transfer learning. Um, and uh, and for, this, for the case of city B, uh, then basically it starts uh, from a similar initial solution as the other method, but, uh, uh, but uh, over the course of training, uh, it achieves a, a, a higher cumulative reward. Um, and we have seen similar things happening for uh, temporal transfer uh, cases as well. Um, and I promise that uh, I'll come back to this uh, navigation example uh, because it, ha it, it has a particular network architecture that facilitates transfer learning. Uh, so, so this task is to uh, navigate the agent uh, within a city uh, through the Google Street View environment. So, uh, so we recap that uh, it adopts a uh, a, a dual pathway architecture. Actually, this is this is have the similar flavor, you know, to uh, to the order matching case that uh, you explicitly maintain two trains of uh, network blocks, and one part is reserved for transfer, and the other part is uh, city specific. So this uh, this kind of architecture is uh, very effective for transfer learning. Uh, so what it what it does is um, it has uh, a pre-training uh, phase that um, it uh, trains the it pre-trains on uh, multiple cities 
uh, and then transfer to the target city. So, uh, so on the left hand side is a pre-training phase uh, to augment the network architecture uh, by similar uh, recurrent blocks corresponding to different cities. Uh, and then you train the network on uh, on different cities so that your policy uh, LSTM part becomes general enough to to be able to uh, uh, perform in a new city. That's that's a purpose of the pre-training part uh, by training on multiple cities. Um, and, and then um, uh, when you are doing the transfer learning, uh, then you just, uh, you just fix everything else uh, expect, except the, uh, the policy LSTM part for the, for the target city uh, and continue training from there. Yeah, so, uh, so after uh, training, on, uh, training on enough number of uh, cities, then your policy LSTM becomes generally enough uh, to perform well on a new environment. Uh, I think here, the, yeah, this, this uh, green line correspond to the uh, result from transfer learning. Uh, uh, y uh, x axis is number of city uh, in the uh, in the agent, and um, and the y axis is the uh, the goal rewards uh, in the environment. Uh, so overall, the trans the transfer learning method uh, achieves the best result. Uh, so we have finished, um, basically finished all the uh, theoretical and uh, application parts of the tutorial, and uh, we have finally we'll go through a short part uh, for for practical issues. Right. And uh, you know, in order to in order to get our uh, hands dirty. Uh, in uh, experimenting with uh, reinforcement learning, uh, we need some uh, development framework, the, inf the environment frameworks. Uh, so there are common frameworks like um, the uh, OpenAI Gene environment. Um, and uh, if we want to uh, train our agents in the Atari for Atari games, then uh, there's also a specific the arcade game arcade learning environment for uh, the Atari 2600 games. Um, and for robotic tasks, uh, we have Mojoko uh, that provides a physics engine for the, for the robot robotics tasks. Um, and besides the uh, environment framework, uh, there are also algorithm frameworks uh, available, uh, open source. So, so we have uh, OpenAI baselines. Uh, you can find most of the uh, policy based and uh, AC methods in there. Uh, yeah, also has some uh, more recent uh, works like the uh, gen uh, the uh, generative adversarial imitation learning. Uh, and uh, on side uh, experience replay. Mm. And Keras IL is, uh, is a pretty handy tool to use as well because uh, it's based on uh, Keras, um, the higher level uh, neural network abstraction. And, and it provides some um, uh, common uh, DIL methods like DQN, and Sasa. DDPG, so you can find all of them there. Um, yeah, and then Google also has provided a uh, uh, algorithm framework called DocuMine. And for computation, um, 
Yeah, I think I think Ray and R Lib, uh, they are uh, developed here uh, in Berkeley. Uh, Ray is uh, it's a Python based uh, execution framework for deep learning and DIL. And an R Lib is uh, is an algorithm framework, so it's similar to uh, to the baseline as well as uh, Keras IL. Tune is for a uh, hyperparameter search for, for tuning your model. Um, so, so Ray integrates uh, both IL and Tune. Uh, for traffic lights control, we have seen uh, uh, a lot of applications use the tr uh, Sumo uh, for conducting the traffic lights sim simulation. Um, yeah, it's a it's a microscopic uh, simulation of a traffic network and traffic lights control. You can you can control uh, the traffic lights and the cars in individual lanes uh, in a very granular manner. Um, and uh, and flow is a, a open source uh, Python library. Uh, that links uh, IRLib with Sumo. So then uh, you have both the training env uh, environment as well as the algorithms. Uh, for autonomous driving, uh, we have seen uh, talks in one of the works. Uh, so both talks and color, they, are, they have three, 3D rendering of the uh, physical environment. Uh, and both are very photorealistic. <laughs> now, what about uh, data sets? Right. Uh, there are also um, several open data sets available, large scale open data sets uh, from. You know, this is this is from um, uh, U.S. highway uh, vehicle trajectory data, um, and um, and the uh, NYC open data. Uh, this is a more diverse. Uh, it uh, includes like street construction, highways, bicycles, etc. And uh, uh, the 2017 KDD Cup data set uh, uh, is for a travel time and uh, travel traffic volume prediction. Yeah, it has the uh, uh, road network topology in the target area. Uh, vehicle trajectories, uh, historical traffic volume, you know, at toll gates and weather data. Um, and yeah, of course, the uh, NYC taxi data set. And we also have published uh, open data sets through the uh, Gaia program. So, uh, so this is a, uh, s actually now a group, a set of data sets uh, that provides anonymized data uh, for, uh, for trips as well as uh, vehicle trajectory. Um, yeah, I'll skip this uh, basically a timeline of the development of that program. Uh, yeah, for vehicle trajectory, uh, um, uh, basically that covers two uh, major cities in China. And, um, and it gives you the start points, end points, uh, routing information, the trips for, uh, for two business lines, the Express and Premier. <coughs> And there's a there's also a data set for a POI, uh, for point of interest. Um, this, this is just some simple statistics for uh, usage of the of the Gaia data sets. Um, already there are hundreds of uh, research institutions uh, using the data to uh, carry out research activities. Uh, so, so this might be helpful. Um, so, uh, if you want to uh, get a uh, open data set, then uh, you can simply uh, scan the QR code and uh, 
uh, go through a very simple verification and review process, and then you have the access to the data. Uh, it's going to be uh, in the PPT slide. So I have my uh, email address here. So uh, if you if you need the slide, you can just send me an email. I'm more than happy to uh, send the slides. Yeah. So I think that's that's pretty much it for today. Yeah. Uh, any questions? that I can answer. So we uh, printed a few of the DD's work regarding different different trial uh, methods. So how, how much of it is exactly uh, actually in this is in the news used by the or Yeah, well, uh, the, order, the order matching methods, um, at least a variant of it, uh, is in production uh, for uh, for yeah, a number of major cities in China, so uh, so that's that's being used in production. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.